talks a little to you, son of Aaron, here in Pensacola, Florida. So I, I think I think that's very important. You know, some you know we're we're, we're great we're, we're the greatest computers, the greatest mainframes, and all these other IT terms that's out there. But at the end of the day, we still must write it down because we're taking in a lot of memory. Write things down, and when you accomplish those things, line them out, and you'll notice how empowered you'll get, and 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 how empowering it is to make you want to accomplish even more. But some of your lists on your to-do list, you're writing things down that's just not practical. They're these poltergeist type things that you that you know you'll never accomplish in your lifetime. So you feel what? Instead of feeling empowered. You feel what? You you have this defeatist attitude. It's notice in the world over. It's because why? It's because why your to-do list is not realistic. It's not practical. So you can't build on poltergeist, but you can build on practicality. You can be, you know, emboldened and strengthened by practicality. Think about that. Something to think about going forward. Mishpah. Begin to apply that method, and I'm telling you, it'll really change your life. Because you you feel empowered, and then you want you want more of that feeling of being empowered. I mean, I'm telling you, you, you can only grow from that. Accomplishment breeds what? More coming, right? It's like a moving train that just gains momentum. You accomplish one thing, you want to accomplish how many other things? Two things. Then after you accomplish two things, you want to accomplish what? Three things. Then after you accomplish three things, you want to accomplish what? Four things. Understand? That's that momentum at work. But can we say the reverse? If all of you have went through high school, you understand the laws of gravity. <laughs> so just like that train of momentum can fall, you drop a rock. And that rock, rock will keep falling until it hits a plate of resistance. <laughs> and as it is, it'll just keep falling until it hits, until it hits that point where it just can't fall anymore. That's the point of resistance. The same way that you, you that you're impractical and you don't, you don't look at the practicalities of life, and you set these grandiose, these poltergeist type uh, uh, events that you write down that you want to happen and they never happen. And you become you, you, you become defeated. And you have a defeatist type attitude. Or, you know, an attitude to where you you know, you can't get anything accomplished. You can't get on. And what happens? It's like a falling rock. And that will be some danger as well. So you can play both sides of the stick. It can go both ways for you. It's happening to some early birds in your life. In your practical lives. Make sure your life, just like Ruby Bonilla said, make sure your life is based on practicality and not poltergeist type moments. Oh yeah, I'm gonna write it down. It's gonna happen just like this. And that Amazon drone's gonna come, and that husband is gonna be in a box, and I'm gonna open that box, and that husband's gonna look just like that. Come on, man, that's not pra that's not practical. But what is practical is you getting on the, you know. On the dating site, or you picking up that phone, or you sending an email to that man that's right around the corner from you. That's practical. I tell you, we need to get back to these moments. You, you know those moments of innocent love back in the day, when you're back in high school, maybe junior high. What did you used to do? I did it. You took that little notepad and you wrote to, to Sally. Oh, lovely Sally, who you would just, you know, you would imagine in your dreams, you know, in school when you daydreaming in a math class or in that literature class, and you write that little note. You write that little note to Sally. You say, Sally, I like you. Do you like me? Check the box. Yes or no? How many of you in this room have done it? I'm going to raise my hand. I've done that. I've done that. I'm going to say, Sally, Sally, you remember that? You remember that? Sally, do you like me? Check this box. Yes or no? And you take the little note, you wrap it up, and you... You know, you, you slip it in Sally's little 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 bag, a little school bag, and you put it in her locker. I, I used to I used to put it in little in Sally's locker. I like, hey Sally, do you like me? I like you. Yes or no? Check the box. <laughs> I, I did that. Yeah, I did that. that. That's innocent love back in the day. That's innocent love when you're coming into yourself. 
Yeah. Yeah, sometimes Sally would check yes and sometimes she would check no. I was like, I'm getting a little confused here, Sally. It's just a yes or no, it's not a maybe. I didn't have a box that said maybe. I only had a box that said yes or no. But sometimes, you know, because I, hey, once a week I would do this to Sally to make sure our relationship was still still good. Even though I never talked to her, Miss Baha, I just sent her this letter. I would send her a letter. Or I would give it to Sally's friend. How many have done that? The way you're too bold to just give it to Sally, but you go through one of Sally's friends. You say, ooh, I know Sally got this red Mary. Let me give this, though. Hey, say, say, Mary, do this at lunchtime. You sit at lunchtime eating your, eating your what, what was it, grilled cheese sandwich back in the day. Ooh, we, lunch, lunch made some good grilled cheese sandwiches with fries back in the day. You sit there, and you go up to Mary, you say, hey, Mary, if you don't mind, can you give this note to Sally for me? And you got it all folded up nice and pretty. You say, hey, give this note to Sally when you get time. Mary, thank you very much, Mary. Enjoy your, enjoy your, 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 your grilled cheese sandwich. And then, you know, just for kicks and giggles, I would always give her a piece of my grilled cheese sandwich and say, hey, you want my fries, Mary? Appreciate you doing that. So, I mean, these are things that we have to look at. I mean, this stuff seems so innocent. That's innocent love back in the day. But I'm telling you, writing things down are important. I mean, I felt empowered even doing that step. I felt, because I was a shy, I was a shy, shy guy in school, especially when it came to women. Because my father always told me that my, my girlfriend was my books. Your book is your girlfriend. So I was just real shy when it came to women. Well, they were just little girls, just like I was a little boy. So it's a little innocent love. But that same innocent love can be taken and put into effect today because I tell you what, my relationship with my wife here in, in America now began with the same letter. It just wasn't licking a stamp. It was an email. I began just emailing my wife. Innocent love. Look at the patterns. They still fit. They still work, Miss Barr. Don't downplay innocent love. But how many of you have fallen into the, the wrong kind of... You, you, you fell into that, that trap of material love instead of innocent love to where you thought you could buy a woman's love. How many of you have been in that category? I was at one time. I was working like a Jamaican, two or three jobs as a teenager. Trying to get this girl all these things, trying to make her love me. That didn't work out too well. She liked the gifts, but she, she said, I don't like you, I like Sam. <laughs> I was like, man. You had me working like a Jamaican just to tell me you you like Sam? But that was my fault. I couldn't blame her. I should have just kept it old school and came with the innocent love. Do you like me? Yes or no? Check the box. Then I wouldn't have had to work like a Jamaican two or three jobs. To get her all those nice little things that she wanted back in the day. Huh? There we go. You, we live and we learn, right? We learn from our experiences to make us better people. So on that note, I think I'll close. Look, <laughs> I'll close up early introduction. But back to the question that I had for you is how, how do you do justice? How do you do justice? How do you do it? That's the question. Think about it. We'll talk more about it during my lecture. Shabbat Shalom to all of you, Mishpah. Hope you all have a wonderful Shabbat. Uh, enjoy, enjoy the time with your family, your friends, and your loved ones. And even more importantly, take... And take something and learn from the lectures that you hear today and begin to apply it in your life. Begin to make it practical. <coughs> make Torah practical and you'll be a great success in this, on this earth. But you must make Torah practical. Most people want to follow a Torah that's a poltergeist Torah. A Torah that's foreign to them and strange. And they're waiting, they wait for these strange happenings to occur. You know, like E.T. coming from you know, coming to you and, and, and wanting to phone home, knocking on your door, wanting to use yourself. See, I want these, these ridiculous things that are just practical. So, make Torah practical and you do yourself well. You'll serve yourself very well in this, in, on this earth while you walk this earth. So, Shabbat Shalom to all of you, Mishpah. Oh, by the way, how many of you did see Jupiter the other night? Uh, the Jupiter, the planet Jupiter, it was, it was, it, man, my goodness, I was walking the other night, I was like, what is this bright star? Come to find out it wasn't a star, I think it was Wednesday night, but it was actually Jupiter. Right below the moon, you could see Jupiter, my, my goodness, I was like, Brooke, let's jab to the creator of the heavens and the universes.
and we can witness such spe spectacles. I like to look at the stars, Mr. Bob. I'm a big fan of looking at the stars. And I got a treat the other night that Abba showed us another planet. <laughs> wow, that's awesome. Right from the confines of my cozy home here in San Antonio, Texas. Yes, the other night you could have seen Jupiter. It's awesome. The planet. It's no Hollywood wink stuff here. It's real live stuff on the ground. So, yeah, Christian Master Jesus, Christian Master Yeshua, for another opportunity for us to learn and be practitioners of practicality. Shabbat Shalom to you all, Mr. Ha. Hope you all have a wonderful Shabbat. And we'll fire it up whenever the Hakoin is ready. If any of you have testimonies, any of you like the mic, you want to give a steam to Master Yahweh, to Master Yeshua, to Master Jesus for any great things that have occurred in your life these past six days of labor. I'll tell you what, miracles happen when you begin to make them happen. When you begin to uh, make them happen. Yes. That's when miracles happen. When you begin to go out and do miracles, which just manifest. But if you sit in your lazy boy chair, you'll never see a miracle. You gotta make miracles happen, and you just have to just begin to go out and do. And I believe me, miracles will manifest. You want more miracles in your life? Just begin to begin to go out and make Torah practical. I'm telling you, I'm telling you, this is how miracles happen. If you notice throughout all of our rich history as Hebrews, descendants of the Hebrews, you'll see miracles happen to those people that they had to take that they did something. They had to do something. Miracles just didn't come to them in an Amazon box via drone. Then stuff don't happen if they were doing something. They may not have been doing it right, but they were taking action on something. Think about it. Think about that going forward. I tell you, it'll really change. Yeah, if you have a paradigm shift in your in your life, in your life. Shabbat Shalom to all of you, Mishpah. Have a wonderful Shabbat. Enjoy the lectures and learn from them. Listen to the Kohen, hang on his every word. Uh, yes, good morning and uh, uh, good evening and good afternoon, I guess. Uh, Shabbat Shalom uh, from Florida. And uh, this is uh, Rabbi Simon Altef. Uh, we've got a kind of a, a nice uh, a, a rain coming through this morning uh, plenty of it which is kind of good water the garden and uh, I guess if this was England it probably streets would be probably be you know almost flooded uh, I, I can imagine that uh, if this happened in uh, New Orleans it would be flooded as well because that's a, a lower ground and then you know over there you know in England at least uh, they would probably my, my goodness the reservoirs will be full so Baruch Hashem, Master Yeshua, great, I mean rain is good, rain can be a blessing, water can be a blessing, and water can be a curse, depends which way you take it, it's very important. With that I had a, a, a joke, obviously a little uh, a lightening up, <coughs> as you know that my you know, uh, jokes are not just jokes, they actually are related to the lecture title itself, today's Pasha is Pasha's Shoftim, uh, we will look at that. But we will look at the important aspects of it, not so much as you know, uh, so much as uh, a judge's commandments and what not. Of course, they're important, but we will look at another aspect of that, which I think that is missing in a lot of people's lives around us that we see. So, with that, <coughs> my lecture title will be God's interruptions, or you could even say God's judgments, or judgment, really, in other words. It's a decision by God. It really, let's let's look at it uh, not from the fiery angle. Everybody looks at judgment as some kind of fiery retribution that God does against man. Well, let's look at it from another angle today, uh, from a God's merciful side. Judgment as a decision for a person, for his good, not necessarily for his bad. So with that, we have this joke about three pastors and a drunk man. Three preachers, they were driving down the road when they missed a turn and went into a ditch, straight into a ditch, coming down too fast. And as they pulled themselves together, a drunk pulled up and asked if they were all okay. And uh, the, one of the pastors responded, oh yeah, Jesus is with us. And then the drunk thought that for a minute, then he said, well, you'd better let him get in with me, otherwise you're going to kill him. 
<coughs> so with that we start our our lecture i think this is a <coughs> very important to understand uh that uh, what this man you know what this what these three preachers said normally in the religious world you know when we go out there this is what we find e- jesus is with everybody in master issue was with everybody in the religious world in in the world of clergy i'm talking about not the ordinary folks you know who sit sincerely in churches week in week out to experience god's goodness and and many do and many don't and they sit in week in week out and they are hoping for god's goodness in their life of us for some reason that seems to elude them so this message is relevant to many people out there today who attend churches and, and not that uh, there is anything wrong with attending churches but it is very important to be in a place that is anointed by god and when i say anointed we can't say that a building is anointed by god because you know we're in the diaspora in north america it could be somewhere else we're not in israel i mean israel every part of the ground is is anointed theoretically theoretically only but practically you know the 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 mercy of god or the uh sovereignty of god although he rules the land rules the world but as we know that his shikhaina his glory only comes when the people are right so this is why the anointing has to be on the person not on the building i think that's very important as well and uh, as i as i remind you of the words of master yeshua uh, from uh, matthew chapter 7 he said something he said do not judge that you be not judged for whatever standard you judge with you shall be judged the same and with whatever measure you measure it shall be measured to you the same now uh, a lot of people don't understand what that really means and if I, i i i can guarantee you if i ask people in this forum i'm going to get different responses for this very particular verse and i'm going to do that i'm going to ask you i want to ask all of you to put you know give me your input what do you see in this verses that the master issue jesus of nazareth is speaking about what is he trying to convey to the audience because remember he was out in the open in a street type of environment he's speaking to anybody and everybody that can hear him he's not sitting in a synagogue is not in a church is is not in a building he's outside and he is the anointed messiah so with with your inputs i'll be uh, uh, grateful if you could just put put in a, a few words whatever you feel uh it'd be good so we have uh, one person saying james is saying don't judge hypocritically okay anybody else for uh, top that please Okay see now now people are thinking because it's Saturday morning I guess in most places and Saturday afternoon over Europe so now people have to think a little bit about about these words and uh they they begin to take a different meaning so okay so I think uh, James made a good start uh Yael woman of the tent says you're going to be held to the same standard that you use against others okay uh anybody else for that matter because i guess the verse goes on into a whole different context you know it speaks about a speck in your a brother's eye a log in your eye it then speaks about the hypocritical standards it it talks about do not you know the 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 swine and the pearls verse although we have it slightly translated differently do not hang earrings on dogs neither cast your pearls before pigs and it, it and it says ask and it shall be given you seek and you shall find knock and it shall be opened to you this is a fabulous verse I mean I really love these verses because these re- these verses resonate with me and ever ever since I became a believer these verses have resonated with me ever since last you know near, near not 20 years uh they resonate with me and uh so I see some more people responding saying I think he's saying how you judge someone you judge the same another one saying don't make yourself a judge uh and then I got another answer judge with right ruling or righteousness Okay, uh, anybody else for that matter? Okay, good answers, all good answers nevertheless. Uh so we will, you know, we will look at this verse in complete 
and we will look at it and because you know we'll try to get some understanding uh, as what the master is saying because of course uh, everything ties back to the Torah whatever came out of the master Yeshua's mouth it ties back to the first five books of Moses nothing that he said is outside the context of Moses so I have another one uh, saying if one pass harsh judgment on others the same sort of judgment will be applied to us your mercy if we expect mercy uh, then judge yourself and not others okay great uh, uh, thank you to all I think that's sufficient thank you very much and uh, let me just read out the, 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 the verses in question and I want to you know juxtapose it with the Torah as well with our Pasha so chapter 7 verse 1 do not judge that you not be judged for whatever standard you judge with you shall be judged the same but let's go back one verse and let's go back to what was termed chapter 11 and uh, sorry chapter 6 and if you remember chapter 6 is a famous chapter with the prayer remember the famous chapter of Inu Shab Shamayim Yitka Do uh, which is our prayer which starts with which starts with our Abba in the Shamayim Kadosh or set apart or holy be your name and that's very important that's the context of the previous chapter and then we go forward and then you know it ends with the last word uh, first in chapter 6 verse 30 34 take therefore no thought for tomorrow for tomorrow shall worry for itself today has enough troubles of its own and then before that verse 33 my goodness I, I love this verse you know because I, these are the verses that I studied years ago and I pondered on those to get a deeper understanding and really you know they helped me a lot in my life and I'm pretty sure they will help you in yours uh, but above all seek first the kingdom and his righteousness and all these things shall be added to you and so we go forward to chapter 7 and chapter 7 really starts with the judgment uh, for whatever standard you judge and then it goes on to why do you seek the speck in your brother's eye but fail to see the beam of wood and or how will you say to your brother let me pull out the speck etc and then it says you hypocrite first cast out the beam do not you know do not uh, if you can go with the standard interpretation it's no problem if you want to do that I mean for that I'll have to pull up my King James edition instead of the Hidden Truths and Breaks Scrolls uh, edition of the Bible which I think says something to the order of uh, let me see Matthew chapter uh, where's Matthew chapter 7 Matthew chapter 7 and the King James edition Matthew 7 and it is verse, verse, yeah, verse 6. Give not that which is holy unto the dogs, neither cast ye your pearls before swine, lest they trample them under their feet, and turn again and rend you, or tear you apart, as old English there. Uh, then we look at the hidden truths to break scrolls, Brith Hadasha. Uh, it says, do not hang earrings on dogs, neither cast your pearls before pigs, lest they trample them under their feet, and turn again, and tear ye apart. Ask, and it shall be given you. Seek, and you shall find. Knock, and it shall be opened to you. For, for everyone that asks, receives, and he that seeks, finds. And to him that knocks, it shall be opened. Now that verse is relevant to my life, and I'll explain in a second why. Now what man is it of you whom his son asks lachem bread, will he give him a stone? Or if he asks for a fish, will he give him a snake? If you then being evil know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more shall your Av, Abba, who is in the Shemaim, give good things to them that ask him? Therefore, all things, whatever you would that men should do to you, do you even so to them. For this is the Torah and the prophecy. See what I said earlier? I said that everything that spoke out of the mouth of the Master Messiah, Yeshua, is from the Torah. And then he said, then he talks about the narrow door and the wide door. Now, let me take you back to the Torah itself and read to you Pasha's Shoftim, which is uh, the book of uh, Deuteronomy. And we are in uh, chapters 16, and we come to verses 18. You will make judges and officers in all your gates, which the Lord your God or Yahweh your power gives you throughout your trials and they shall judge the people with righteous judgment now that one was sums it up really but then we go forward you shall not distort the judgment now this is where the master Yeshua's words tie in 
you shall not distort the judgment nor you shall regard a person standing neither take a bribe for a bribe will blind the eyes of the wise and pervert the words of judgment justice justice you will pursue remember he spoke about the words Matthew 6 verses 30, 33 and I said that I love those verses because I often used to look at those and try to understand the meaning of that what it actually means Matthew 6 33 says it says that if I pull it up <clears throat> it says but above all seek first the kingdom and his righteousness and all these things shall be added to you you can find them right here in the book of Deuteronomy I mean it didn't pull it out of thin air it came out of the book of Deuteronomy justice justice you will pursue in other words righteousness must be pursued in all instances in all costs that you may live and inherit the land which Yahweh power gives you or in your other Bibles the Lord your God and it says you shall not then it talks about you shall not plant any tree as an Asherah image near to the altar of Yahweh your power uh, which you shall make for you neither shall you keep uh, any, neither shall you set up any graven image which Yahweh your power or the Lord your God hates ok so we'll stop there but I think the context is set of the master's words within the first three verses of that Pasha you shall make judges is one you shall not distort the judgment is two justice justice righteousness you will pursue is three I think you need to focus on that I encourage all the rabbis in the room who, are, uh, who have students and who go out to teach others I encourage you all to always look at the verses in the New Testament with the eyes that are going to link your verses back to the words of Moses the law of God very very important because we cannot take verses out of context and make it out well you know he came he set up a new religion and now we have a different constitution and now we're in a different um, you know how do the, the the Christians use the word a dispensation you know all these fanciful words that I've got no idea you know coming from a a foreign background I guess I, I have uh, some of these words I have to check up on the dictionary what dispensation means and you know what what uh, I know what constitution means because I've sat in a, you know, with enough politicians and uh, lawyers uh, so I know what that means but my point is, is that you know, when I first heard the word, the word dispensation I was like what does this word mean dispensation so I had to go check up my dictionary you know, Oxford concise dictionary and find out what word dispensation means <coughs> So these are the kind of inventions that uh, I guess Christian uh, uh, Christian uh, authors or Christian pastors or bishops, preachers, whatever came up with to try to, I guess try to understand because they try to separate the Messiah's words from the Torah. They had no they had no interest in the Torah. They were not interested. They call that the old covenant, oh you know, old words, you know, they're not they're not necessary for us any longer. They use those those kind of ways. But it, it is very important that we understand because here I got I get people coming to me, uh, you know, privately of course, you know, and I don't speak about all the conversations I have, but I think sometimes it's important to speak about some of the conversations or at least part of the conversations. And one of the conversations goes to the effect of but Rabbi, why aren't I getting, why aren't I making it? Why, uh, why am I struggling? Why don't I have the finances that everybody else seems to be thriving? You know, Joe Bloggs down the street, you know, he has a beautiful new car, he bought for $40,000. You know, they're living in an $80,000 home, you know, giving you the rates uh, that are uh, down here, I guess, 100000 let's just say in your areas might be $200,000 home and cars are still going to be $40,000. So you know they might say that is is living in a two hundred thousand dollar home, a forty thousand dollar car, fully paid for. But why aren't I making it? You know why is he making it? He's he is he is uh, uh, not even in my church, and he doesn't go to church, and I go to church, and you know why am I who go to church don't get it, and why he doesn't go to church he gets it? Why why is God in favor? You know is God in uh, against me? Is is God more in favor of him and less favor of me? Well, what what does this mean? So you know, these are the these are the life questions that you might get as teachers of the of the words of God. As teachers, you're going to get though, and you're going to have to address those questions because they don't have simple answers. But actually, if you look at the words of Master Yeshua, the context, and you go back, and you can then see the the resolution is very clear because in chapter seven it says, "Whatever standard you judge with, you shall be judged the same." Now, this is talking about 
not just words of uh, of you know judging somebody like you know somebody said something to you you said something back and back and forth back and forth no it's not talk, it's not talking about that it is not talking about that at all in fact it's telling you it's telling it's actually going much deeper this is what i call the not the written torah but i call it the spirit of the torah so what the master has spoke about is the spirit of the torah and as i learned as i studied and as i as i prayed to god to give me more understanding uh, over the years and he explained and understanding came it took years to get the understanding it wasn't overnight but understanding came that spirit of the torah is not just in the, the, the letter of the is what's more important the letter or the spirit the spirit of the torah is more important the letter of the torah will never change the torah will never change the letters will remain the same same hebrew you can translate it into a million languages no problem the the hebrew will never change unless you know they start changing the dots and the and then in, in the titles you know uh, uh, and they start making new meanings but those words will you know the actual hebrew letters will be the same the point is the hebrew letters will not change you know you could put a, a dot and a dash and change the meaning somewhat but you you're not going to change the letters the letter a beth will be a beth and an alif will be an alif a gimel will be a gimel doesn't matter what what you apply above and below it but what's important he said that what measure you measure it shall be measured to you so there is the answer for somebody who comes to me and says to me well, why is why is job blogs down the road making it why is he got a 200000 dollar home and i haven't got i'm living on rent why is he driving a 40000 dollar car nissan car and i've got none so answer is there what is your measure maybe job blogs down the road who is not religious he doesn't go to church but his measure is right that is actually a fascinating fascinating understanding because what the fact that the man who doesn't go to church his measure is correct maybe in god's eyes the one who doesn't go to church his measure is correct he measures graciously to somebody else and maybe your measure because you go to church well in quotes you have pastor so and so teaching you and pastor so and so all he does he gives you the same sermon i mean I mean let's be honest I mean I went to churches years ago sat in churches and listened to uh, sermons and all I heard was the same thing year in year out I mean I was there about 5 years you know in messianic churches I mean I went to teach I sat and listened to many lectures I went to teach as well in many different places all over the world I taught and every week you know that I some of these places believe me every week was the same thing over and over and over again it would be a maybe a 30 minute lecture 30 minute sermon you know there was a lot of nice hymns that they sang beautiful hymns i still remember some of those but uh, the sermons were no different so the the measure you see the measure comes from your understanding so this this job blogs gets it because he measured right Let me give you an example. Let me give you now some truth now that's going to be hard to understand. Not hard to understand, it'll be very easy. I ha- I know a stock broker. I know a stock broker who's a millionaire. And he's a teacher. He teaches stock broking to people. He teaches them how to do the stocks like he does. And he you know, he 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 makes whatever he makes is over is is a million dollars or above. Uh, or maybe sometimes he makes he's a, he's a millionaire. Actually, he doesn't make a million to be honest. I think he makes between 300 and 400,000 dollars he makes every year so last year i know this man listen to this he is a he is a, a simple man he is not a christian in the sense of going to church every sunday and you know you know placards of jesus all over the place he is not like that but the measure he measured right that's what surprised me and i thought to myself you know what a lot of people are clueless about what's going on because of what we see with this person what he just did he earned about 272000 dollars last year this 2017 year he he declared you know it was all over the internet he declared that he made 200 and some 72000 dollars he he earned out of his uh, stock broking and he said that he was going to donate the entire amount to charities the entire amount he said i'm going to donate the entire amount that i made this year to charities you know that i love and there were several charities you know some christian some non christian different ones and there you have your answer 
So if when somebody comes to me and says, well, how come Joe Bloggs down there is having a $40,000 car and a $200,000 home? And by the way, he has a, he has a $40,000 plus thousand car and a $200,000 plus home. But the look at what the man gave. He gave his entire year's salary to these uh, causes, charitable causes. So what does that teach you? The words of Jesus come to mind. You know, what did he say? By what measure you measure, it will be measured to you. So if you have given away your entire salary for the year, how do you think God is going to perform on your behalf? Think about it for a second. And how many of you are giving, giving up your salaries? Not that I'm asking you to give up your salaries, but I'm just a question. It's the question. I gave a hundred thousand plus salary myself. I can speak for me. I can't speak for anybody else. I gave that away for God. And I have been giving it away for every year since I've been here. I have given it away because that would have been three hundred thousand dollars to today. I would have made three hundred thousand dollars if I stayed in England. And I gave that to God. Now try and top that. So let's 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 say that this person who gave two hundred something, I actually even topped him. And every year I stay here, I will top him further. That's the measure I have measured. That I've decided that God. And his righteousness is more important and I need to follow him and I need to do what he says. So I, I resigned from a job. You all know that. Didn't make it up. You know, I even have the, 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 the slips still to prove it. I was earning I was earning around about conversion hundred thousand dollars. With other 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 things, bonuses, it was over a hundred thousand. Yes, it does, it does apply to measure. Uh, uh, Rabbi Benai is asking, uh, Hakohen, when Master Yahweh speaks about where your treasure is, that's where your heart is. Does this apply to measure? Yes. So, my point is this. I had somebody, I'm giving you now true stories. This is not made up stories. This is not like, oh, well, you know, he just read it in a book and he wrote. These are real, these are real scenarios that are occurring before me. And I'm telling you that by what measure you measure, it will be measured back to you. Somebody, uh, three years ago, Somebody I, I met about two years ago, let's just say, I was traveling around the country back in 2015 and 16. So, yeah, about two to three years ago, I was traveling around and I met somebody, I won't name the state, I met somebody in a state and I sat with them and I chat with them and they were struggling. They were real struggling. And uh, they asked me the question. And they basically said that we're in a job. Yes, we have a job, but we are struggling. Our salaries aren't extremely high. And uh, this is a situation at hand, but we want, to, we want to get ahead, but we feel that we're not able to get ahead. You know, what is the problem? And, uh, you know, I gave them a solution, but they never followed it up. So don't ask me for solutions if you don't follow it up. Because all you do is you do disservice to God and to yourself. You won't do a disservice to me because it doesn't change my life. But it does change yours and, and you do disservice to God for sure. Because when you ask for something, you must follow it through. So what happened in that particular scenario, I'll give you a brief, is that they, the way to come out of their situation was very simply. They needed to do what this guy did. And uh, you know, give you the name of the person. Whether this person is internet, Google it. Check what Jason asked here. His salary, what he gave last, told you. So Jason, by the way, this is a real guy. You know, he's a real man. He, he was in a teaching profession, teaching profession, and became, you know, he started to trade the stock market instead. And he, you know, he that's that the last he dealt with the best stocks. And, but my point is, they like that job's example. So when these people came to measuring, what people were maintenance. They weren't even giving their tithe. They were working, but they were not 10%. To me, well, and you're given maybe 1%. If you earn, if you earn $1,000, what is 1% of $1,000? Okay, so any math genius in our midst? Alright, so let's make it simple. Ten, yeah, it's, it's simple. Hundred dollars, one percent is ten dollars. Now, if you give, let me give you an example. I'm not saying this is what you do, but this is what you might be doing. If I give, if I give ten dollars to God, and I'm earning a thousand dollars, and God's instructions are very clear that you're to give ten percent, your offering to the person in the gate, the coin in the gate. And if you just give ten dollars, are you following the instructions? So when Jesus' words were, what measure you measure? Well, if you measure ten dollars of your salary, one percent, then God is going to measure one percent back to you. Please understand that. This is reality of life. 
if you only measure one percent then God will measure one percent back and say here you go you gave one percent now what you're gonna do with ten dollars suddenly maybe you won ten dollars on the jackpot or you know you put a lottery you won you know you got two numbers or something and you got ten dollars or maybe you know you got ten you know you got a little raise and your, your salary went up ten dollars you're gonna say you you're gonna turn around and say well that's not that's not gonna help me is it or Mr. Trump came and he set the new tax laws and now you can save ten dollars in tax and you're complaining you're whining oh you know I'm only getting ten dollars and you know a, a, a month in my salary but isn't that what you gave didn't you just give ten dollars by what measure you measure is master's words by what measure you measure it will be measured to you if Simon Altaf is going to measure a hundred thousand dollars every year what do you think is God going to return to Simon Altaf for the second He's going to return the same amount back to Simon Altaf every year for his rest of his life. Because Simon Altaf was faithful to God. He didn't say, oh, I'm going to, I'm going to save, you know, $99,000 of my salary. I'm going to just take $1,000 out and give that every year. That's my tithe. You see, if I, if I did that, I would be guilty, exact, exactly as you, of giving 1% and expecting 100% back. Or maybe 200%. So it doesn't work like that. So we have to understand the words of Master Yeshua very clearly. And I just gave it to you. I gave it to you already. That that what you what you measure is not a lie. I, I I set God's name before me today, and I'll tell you that whatever measure you measure, God will measure it before you. And it is not a lie. It is 100% truth. The words that came out of the Master Yeshua in Matthew chapter 7 verse 2. For whatever standard, whatever measure you judge with, you shall be judged the same. It's not just talking about, uh, um, you know, judgments regarding this, that and the other. It's talking about everything in your life. Money, relatives, family, wives, children, properties, cars, everything. Everything that you, you do will be the same. And then it, then it talks about why do you seek the speck that is in your brother's eye. Well, it's saying that why are you judging your brother when you yourself are faulty? When you yourself fall short, well, if I fall short of God's measure, you know, if I fall short of His measure, and Shoftim talks, talks about judgments, the, the, the partial Shoftim talks about judgments, and if I'm going to fall short of God's decree, by the way, take that as a God's decree. The decree means the words that I have uttered out of God's mouth, I cannot distort them. I cannot say, oh, well, let me go around them, and let me do it this way, let me do it that way. What Jews do today, by the way, they do that. They are guilty of distorting God's judgments. Everything that we, we, we read in the Torah today is being distorted in so-called Messianic and, uh, and Orthodox synagogues. It says, you will make judges and officers in all your gate. It says, which, which, which you can say your whole wife you like, you can say Lord your God if you like. It's fine. I'm not going to judge you on that. But you got to do what is what it says. They shall judge the people with righteous judgment. You shall not distort the judgment. When we have every church out there, if it's going to distort God's law, and if every synagogue out there is going to distort God's law, where is justice on this earth? Because chapters, chapter 16 of Deuteronomy verses 20, ring up justice, justice twice. The words are used there twice. Why did God use those words twice? Because clearly, you and me both know, when in the Torah, when a word is used twice, it means there's emphasis placed on that word. God has placed emphasis on that word, and He wants us to take note. That's why He says them twice in verses 20. And He wouldn't say them twice if, they were not important because you know the King James Version is such a bad translation in those verses it says that which is altogether just shall thou follow what a bad translation that is not what the Hebrew says by the way such a such a nasty little translation you know so so bad you know, when I read that translation it, it really you know it really angers me sometimes that these people who sat with good intentions to translate the Bible they didn't do a, a, a proper job they did a very poor job of translating Deuteronomy 16.20. You know, the words there are clearly in the Hebrew, Zadik, twice. Zadik, Zadik. And look at what the translation does. Completely nullifies it. 
you know, clearly nullifies it by translating it that which is altogether just. Well, it didn't say that. Thou shall follow. <laughs> Come on. My goodness. I mean, you look at the king, hidden truths, it breaks clothes, it thrashes that translation. It says, justice, justice you will pursue. Exactly what the Hebrew says, justice, justice you will pursue, that you may live. Now the next verse says, you may live. Now what does living mean? God's decree or man's decree? God's judgment or man's judgment? Which one would you like to follow? So, which decree would you like to follow? Would you like to follow God's decree or would you like to follow man's decree? <coughs> I would suggest that I would follow God's decree always. And anybody that God has appointed underneath him, anointed, like remember I said to you, if, you're an, if, if the building is not anointed but the person is. Well, if the person is anointed by God, then yes, you'll follow him. And if he's a, if he's a, if he's a priest, I'm mean, not talking about a Catholic priest over here, but I mean not that not that Catholic priests are bad. I'm not saying that in that sense, but I'm just saying that a priest in the English language could be any could mean anything. Could be a Muslim priest, a, uh, a Catholic priest, a, you know, a Christian maybe a pastor is a, is a is a is a similarity. But when we are saying a priest, we're talking about a Levite, we're talking about a Kohen. These are the priests we are talking about. Priests that God has established. So is a difference. So therefore. <coughs> Therefore, it is very important that we understand that here, what God is saying opposed to what man is saying. What is man telling you? Man is telling you one thing, God is telling you another. So, who are you going to follow? So, this, this, is, this is where, you know, the, the, this is where you start, you know, putting the milk to the side and you start dealing with the, the, the beef, you know, the actual meat. So, we are talking about meat here not milk. So here when the Master Yeshua was standing before people, when he was standing before people and he was you know talking about the laws and what he was seeing was exactly what I told you, hypocrisy. Hypocrites and who were these hypocrites? These hypocrites were religious people around him. They were the people who wore the long garbs. Then you know today you might see a uh, uh, maybe uh, I mean I don't really see many people wearing these long garbs today. But if I do, if I'm, you know, while I'm traveling, sometimes I see these people at the airport. You know, these you know, kind of uh, uh, Catholic type people. You know, nuns and those kind of people are seeing long, you know, black garbs. Or maybe you might see a reverend uh, traveling, etc. So these are the kind of people you might see uh, when you travel because you don't see them all the time. So these are the kind of people that Master Yeshua was speaking about. Jesus of Nazareth is speaking about those kind of people that are pretending, or maybe they are not pretending. Maybe they're trying. Maybe they're trying to serve God, but in their in their trying, they are they're in their pretense because they are following dictates, commandments, dispensations of a, a dogma of maybe men, which is which is predominantly true in most of the churches, as you know. The dogma that they are following is of men, not of God. God's dogma. God's you know dictates, God's decrees I should say are never followed. I mean just look around yourself. How many how many churches do you know that follow God's decree of the Sabbath? How many? I mean you could just ask you could just uh, you know look in your city and look at how many how many churches say Sabbath keeping Christians. Uh, I haven't seen a single one here, I guess except Seventh day Adventists. And you know what happens with Seventh-day Adventists? Well, the Christians will say, Evangelicals and the, and the Protestants and the you know, Methodists and the, and, the, and the Baptists, they will say, oh, they are not Christian because they follow the Sabbath. So, you know, so, they, so that is your second part. Your second part is where the Master said, look in the speck, you know, look in the log of your own eye before you judge the speck in your brothers. Well, who is the brother? In this case, the brother is a Seventh-day Adventist. He is trying to keep the Sabbath. Well, at least he's trying, right? At least you've got to give him that. But he's trying to do the Ten Commandments. But what do the Christians say? Oh, oh no, he is, he is following the Old Covenant. He is not good. He should be in the New, forgetting that the New is part of the, part of the Ancient Covenant, the First Covenant. So, so we, we find that that's kind of interesting. The speck, the, the speck in the brother's eye, let's just say that brother is Seventh-day Adventist, and then the, the, the log is a, is a Christian, 
who doesn't keep the Sabbath, well, that says it all, doesn't it? So who's who's right? Is is the brother right, or is the Seventh Day, you know, uh, is the non Seventh Day Adventist right? The Christian stroke Baptist stroke Methodist, whatever you know, denomination they want to call themselves, they're all stuck with denominations. I mean, this person that I red dotted in here, what is he talking about? Denomination again. So anybody who speaks about denomination will be get red dotted over here immediately. I'm not even going to address their question because we are not here to promote a denomination. Torah is not a denomination. Torah is law, how you live. And let me read out to you the next verses of Shoftim. If that hasn't kind of jolted you a little bit and given you some understanding, then it says, it says this, Justice, justice you will pursue, that you may live. Now, what does live mean? You see, we need, we need to understand, what does live mean? Or does it mean that I can just, you know, uh, you know, do anything I want to and live the way I like and you know, does that may does that mean so the word Hebrew word chaya there you can look it up in your you know in your in your in your scrolls you can look up the word chaya in your uh, what's that uh, Strong's you know you can look it up and see the different meanings of chaya chaya means life now what kind of life are you going to have what kind of life you have is dictated by what kind of life you're intending to live. Now, if I'm going to live on God's decrees, God's appointment, God's justice, if you're going to do that, <clears throat> well, if, you, if, you, if you're going to do that, then great. If you're going to do that, then you're going to live. But what kind of life will you have if you do that? Well, you see, I'm not going to address any one particular individual because, you know, otherwise I'll end up <laughs> throwing out some people in the room who are just making noises. So, <clears throat> my point is simple this, that I'm in the no mood, right, to just listen to people's garbage. I'm not in no mood for that today. And uh, so, therefore, my point is very simple. If I put my life out, I don't expect you to put your life out. I don't expect you to do that. But, if you, ask, if you tell me that you want, you want to serve God, and that you do what God says, then I will ask for proof. I will say, show me. When did, are you doing what God says? God said, God said to keep the Sabbath. That wasn't the only thing God said. God said many other things. Are you doing those things? Not just the Sabbath. Are you, are you giving the tithes to your coin? Well, I haven't received the tithe from many people so far. So, are you, are you tithing to the coin in the gate? And the answer will be no for most of these people. And then, he will, then he will go to explain why not. Well, they don't know about it or they don't want to do it. And then they, they give you this verbiage that I follow God. What a nonsense. You see, these are the kind of hypocritical people that you deal with all the time. So, that's not the only thing. What about permissible laws? Permissible food laws? What about permissible acts of, of daily living? What about those acts? Kindness, mercy, justice. You know, what about the fact that, you know, you've got to do a certain things in a certain way. And if, you, if you're going to tell me, well, you know, uh, oh, I didn't know about it. Well, that, that's a far cry from following God, isn't it? It's a far cry. But nevertheless, this is why, this is why I was saying earlier that three pastors in the joke who went into the ditch actually had the same theology. Think about it. They all had Jesus with them, but they still ended up in the ditch. And the drunk man who came to help them, he said, give me Jesus instead, so that he may not die with you. I, I kind of found that rather funny, because, because <clears throat> technically, Jesus is not an object that you can put him in your pocket and you know, he'll be with you wherever you go. You know, Jesus, Yeshua of Nazareth, is his, his, technically his God. He is Yahweh himself. So if he's God, you know, put God in your pocket, in your car, you're going to hang him up like a cross, what are you going to do? You put him on a cross and you, you, you travel with him as, as many Catholics do? Is that you know, your idea of God with you? So this is a problem. Just because you say it, just because you say it, God is with you, doesn't mean God is with you. So let's get that straight. God is with those who, who do what? Because what did the Master say? That seek first the kingdom of God. If you seek first the kingdom of God, then he says God will add everything to you. Well, if I don't even seek the kingdom, how am I going to have everything added to me? Because if I say to God, I need a house, I need a car, I need money for food, 
Well, if I don't seek the kingdom, then I'm like everybody else. He has to give me the same measure as he, as he gives everybody else and doesn't do those things. But if I do those things, if I dare to do those things and I say, yes, I'm going to do that decree, Lord, that you told me to do, then guess what's going to happen to me? Then Deuteronomy 28 becomes active in my life. I will be the head, not the tail. I will be above, not beneath. I will be blessed, not cursed. I will be a victor, not a victim. How many victims do we have in North America, by the way? Every other black person I speak to in North America happens to be a victim. Oh, I'm a victim. Oh, a slavery. Oh, ma, I'm in slavery. Oh, this, uh, oh, we need to make a new nation. What a load of baloney. You know, these people have not served a single day in slavery. Their forefathers, for, for reasons, you know, that we already had, had discussed many times before, became slaves. And these modern people today, modern black people today, have never been slaves. And they have lived in the country. You know, they have the access to education. They have the access to do everything that everybody else does. Yet they still complain and whine that we are still slaves. So if you want to keep the victim you know, mentality, then what do you think you're going to be? If you want to be a victim, then you will be a victim. If you keep telling yourself, I am a victim, you know, I am put down, uh, people are against me. If you keep speaking those words, then those words will come to prophesy in your life. And that's what you will become. You will become, sadly, you will become a victim. You will be, you know, uh, people will be doing uh, bad things against you. They will be putting you down. Uh, they will be cursing you out because you said that for yourself. But if I have decided that I'm going to follow God's decree and I'm going to serve God no matter what, it doesn't mean that I'm going to, you know, go and be nasty to my parents or be rude to people. No, it doesn't mean that. When I say, for whatever reasons, when I say that no matter what, that means that it's my determination. No matter what means, that if I see a hundred thousand salary one side, and I see no salary the other side, then I say no matter what means, if God says to me, Simon, leave that salary, I will leave that salary. That means no matter what. That's how no matter what is translated. But if you're going to tell me that you know, you're going to serve God and you don't even know how to tithe, but you're going to get a slap in your face from me for sure, because you're a hypocrite. You don't follow God. And the Master Yeshua made it very clear. You have to follow the law of Moses. He said it a number of times. And you can't tell me that, oh, there's a new, there's a new dispensation. So you don't bring your fancy words out to me, because I will thrash you still with your fancy words. And I have done with pastors in the past. So, the point is this, that you're talking to dogs. I'm sorry. I'm talking to dogs out there who call themselves pastors. And that's all they are, dogs. And, not, and, not, you know, in, and I say it with respect. I don't say it in, in, you know, with a, uh, a nasty attitude. I say it with respect that they are dogs because they don't follow God's decrees. They have rejected God's decrees. They have not understood the words of the Messiah Yeshua, who is technically God, let's face it. They have not accepted His words, and they continue down the road with dictates of Tertullian, uh, you know, what, uh, what the church fathers have dictated, and others, many other church fathers. And I guess, you know, you, you can just pick up history books, and you can see who they were. Many different church fathers came up with different theories, and majority of those theories, in those theories, majority of those theories hated anything to do with Jewishness. In other words, Israelites, you know, who were technically from, mostly from the tribe of Judah in those times, and Benjamin, uh, because the ten tribes were not there. So anything that they did, anything our people did at that time, they hated it. They hated it, period. So today's majority of these pastors, that's what they follow. They follow the dictates of their forefathers, who were all anti-Semitic haters of our people. And I, I think that that's just succinctly putting it. You know, that's putting it mildly. He didn't just go to the hatred. It went further, one step further. They not only hated our people, they persecuted our people, they imprisoned our people, and they killed our people. They said that anybody who does the Passover is, is Jew. 
he's a Jewish, he's this, he's that, he's cursed. You see, these are the kind of words that were used. Christians need to repent. Christians are there who follow, who follow these kind of church fathers, and I'm not saying all Christians do, but those that did, and those that do today, they need repentance in their lives. Because they are in seer, serious dire straits, because they didn't believe God, because they didn't serve God. They served some dictates of some man from some church, uh, down in Rome or some other church. So we got to be very careful of whose words are we following. Are we following God's decrees? Are we following man's decrees? So this, this. So we, when we come to to appointments of God, God has appointed times. God's decrees, God's justice, God's justice, God's judgment is not always negative. It's not always negative that God says, "Well, I'm going to strike you down, and that's the end of it. No argument." God doesn't say that. So God's judgments are sometimes very beneficial for us. And that judgment usually doesn't always mean it's some kind of, you know, 40 whips in your back. It doesn't mean judgment like that. It could be a decision that God makes in the heavens that's in your favor. To give you an example, you know, you might be praying for a car. You might be praying to God that you want a car and God grants you that car. That's a judgment, by the way. God grants you that car as a judgment, and the judgment really means decision, you know, let's, let's look at it the, the right way. So, uh, upright behavior of God is that God says, you know what, you know, Sam over there, he wants a car, you know, he's been praying, he's been doing the right thing, I'm going to allot him a car, he's going to get his car. Boom, done. One, you know, one word from the heavens, car on your doorstep. So, yeah, you know, God that we serve is not the kind of God of sermon, fortunately. You know, we don't we don't serve the God out of it, who doesn't who 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 only lives in the new covenant, who's forgotten his old laws, who's got a who's got a amnesia. He's now in an old people's home. That's a God in the churches. He's an old people's home. He's got amnesia. You know, he's suffering from dementia. If you want to serve the God with dementia, then yeah, go to the churches and serve the God with dementia. I don't serve the God with dementia. My God doesn't have dementia, by the way. My God upholds everything He said. Yesterday, 2,000 years ago, and 4, 6,000 years ago, and today, that's the God I serve. Non-dementia God. If you want to see the God of dementia, just go to the church down the road. Just go to your local church and you'll find the God of dementia. Oh, he forgot about his commandments. Oh, he suddenly changed the laws. Oh, no longer the Sabbath. My goodness. What a, what a conundrum. What a plow. <laughs> it's just nonsensical, isn't it? So, so, when I'm going to, if I'm going to carry the victim mentality, as you know, many of our people, I've dealt with those people, you know that, you know, you know I've came to your homes, you know I've dealt with those people, victim mentality people, never see it in life. Oh, I'm a victim. Oh, my father's a slave. Oh, this, oh, it's always, it's all whining and whining. The white man this, and the white man this, it's always against the white man. You know, as if the white man was created by Satan and not by God. We are all created in the image of God. White man is created in the image of God, created in the image of God, and so is a brown man, and so is a yellow man. So why then, why, why then differentiate white and black? You know, it's kind of funny, because uh, I say that it's funny, because in, in the news lately, all I, all I could hear uh, all week was Amrosa and the tapes, Amrosa tapes. You put the news on and that's what you hear. Uh, what did Amrosa say regarding President Trump and things going on and the President Trump called her a dog. But then President Trump calls everybody a dog, you know, in that respect. He wasn't being disrespectful in that way, but he was just saying that Amrosa tried to, you know, better herself. Oh, yeah, the N-word as well. They're talking about the N-word too and all of that going on. So, my point is this, is that, you know, and, and I use the word dog respect. By the way, I use the word dog respectively for the pastors. I'm not saying all the pastors are dogs, but I just use it as a paraphrase. Dog meaning, dog meaning Gentile. Dog meaning that they don't obey God's decrees. I use it in that sense. I don't use it in any other particular way. So, but I don't serve the God of dementia. You know, I, I you know, I, I have some uh, students in England, and they they work in nursing homes, and they tell me that one of my students worked in the dementia ward. And, you know, he was telling me that how these old people are mistreated. Very sad though. And he voiced his concern and they fired him. 
because they were they were obviously didn't like him. You know, I said I said to him, why did you why did you uh, you know <laughs> raise your concerns? <laughs> he said because you know they were taking food to these old people and not feeding them, and then they were bringing it back saying that they didn't eat, and and they were taking cold food for them. They were not taking hot food, and I just uh, named my concern. I said, look, uh, when you were there. I said, when you were there, at least food was going to them. Now you're not there. Do you know the food is going to them? So I said, it's kind of. I said, uh, you know, sometimes we have to shut our mouth because some places we are meant to be, other places we are not meant to be. So now that you are no longer there, do you even know food is going to those old people who are in dementia? Because they don't know who to complain to. So see, these are the things that happen in our society. Every day it's happening everywhere. We have to then what do we have to live up to the standard. So what did the master say? The master said many things. I mean, are we going to obey those things? Or are we just going to um, make other things up? You know, he he said many other things. So so for instance, he spoke about the measure. What measure you measure will be measured to you. Well, if I'm going to measure a dishonesty, if I'm going to be dishonest with people around me. If I'm going to mistreat the people, if I if I work in a nursing home and I'm going to mistreat old people because they haven't got nobody to complain to, then what do you think is a measure I will get? Uh, absolutely, Simcha. The neg- negative attitudes bring negative lives. So uh, you know that's very important. Key is negative attitude. If you have a negative defeated attitude, and somebody gave me that, and I had to remind them. You know, people have defeatist mentality. And somebody said, and I re- that really irked me as well. And I, I really, I, I became angry with those words for a little while, a little, a little while. Uh, but you know, uh, that was that, basically. And it was, it was to the effect of, it was to the effect of, well, I'm going to go to jail for this. Well, <laughs> you are going to sp- speak negative, defeated attitude. Where do you think you'll end up? Think about it for a second. So absolutely. So therefore, it's very important to understand that we must remove negative, defeatist attitude from our vocabulary. If you're going to keep repeating words, negative words, and God's giving you positive words, God's not giving you negative words. God's not saying, "Oh, you're going to go to jail." God is telling you that you're going to be above all the nations. You're going to be the head. Not the tail. I didn't say that. Simon Alter didn't make those words. Pick up any Bible in the world, any translation, including the hidden truths it breaks close, and read it in Deuteronomy chapter 28. What did God say about you? And if 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 you don't find those words, you can come back and say Simon Alter is a liar because you know Rabbi Simon gave me these words and he's lied to me. They don't exist in my Bible. Then I'll say, yeah, I'm a liar. I did I did say those words, and I'm I'm telling you that God said you are the head. Then why do you want to become the tail? God said you are the head, not the tail. Why you keep telling me that? Oh, the white man is oppressing you. You're a victim because you want to be the tail. You want to be victimized. You want to be the victim. You want to live in a victim mentality. And the Master Yeshua tells you no. By what measure you measure? Well, if I keep measuring, if I keep saying I'm a victim, I'm black, I'm a failure. Then what do you think I'm going to be? I'm going to be a failure because I've, I've dictated that for myself. If I say that, but if I remind God, if I remind God what God said about me, I am the head, not the tail. I will lend and not borrow. You said that my enemies will rise up against me one way and flee seven ways. If I remind God of His covenant, because my God don't have dementia, the you know the God down the church is mostly they have dementia. My God doesn't have dementia. If my God don't have dementia, my God will remember. Oh yes, yes, Simon, you're right, my son. Yes, you are my son. Yes, you are the head. You're not the tail. When did I make you the tail? I didn't make you the tail. Did I say that? No, I didn't say that you're the tail. I said that you are the head and not the tail. I said that you are not a victim. You are a victor. That's what God will remind me of because my God don't have dementia. But if your God has dementia. Then yes, you are. You know, then you are a victim. Then you are black. Then you are a victim. Your skin is wrong color, and you are a victim. You are a slave. You are this. You are that, and you are third. All of that. You are everything that you say. 
Amen to you. <laughs> if you say everything, then good to you. Let your measure take you as you are. But for me and my house, for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. And the Lord said, you are a, you are a victor. You are the head. And he said, you'll be blessed when you go out of the city. You'll be blessed when you come back into the city. And Baruch Hashem Yahweh, I can tell you that I'm blessed. I'm greatly blessed. When I go out of the city, I'm greatly blessed. When I come into the city, I'm greatly blessed. Even though people around you may not acknowledge that, it doesn't matter. Because God said it. And I receive it. I'm into that. And I'm into that twice. I'm in where I'm in. So I say it twice. So therefore... I would rather receive the words from my non-demented God because my God remembers my God remembers his words he doesn't forget when the Israelites were serving God or were they serving God that's another question in Egypt when they were in Egypt and complaining and whining remember what happened there exactly what North American black people are doing today exactly the same thing was happening in Egypt Complaining, whining, ah, this, ah, that, this Pharaoh, he's, he's making us work hard, and we, you know, where is God, and where is He to help us? All this complaining and whining was going on at that time. Exactly as North American complainers and whiners. Oh, absolutely, the Vora. The Vora is saying that I work with so many black lawyers that own their own law firm. I've never heard a conversation about the white men are holding them. But absolutely, you're right, because they don't have that victim mentality. <laughs> they're not like the, they're not like from the ghettos with the victim mentality. Oh, I must, I must sell drugs to get, get ahead, and you know, the white man is keeping me down, so I have to do the drugs instead. I, I can't work a job. You know, these victim mentalities are all around us. We don't want to be part and parcel of those victim mentalities. You'd rather be with black lawyers who, you know, have a victory mentality, you know, because they're going to win their cases. They're going to be successful lawyers. What, do you, what kind of mentality do you think they will have? Well, they're not, they're not going around on, on YouTube and saying, I'm cursed, I'm a victim, my forefathers were slaves, I can't seem to get ahead. They don't do that. So maybe, maybe, you, maybe some of you need to make some lawyers your friends, because they'll have, hope, hopefully they have, uh, victor mentalities. I'm going to win every case I go out for. I'm a successful lawyer. You know, that's a good mentality to have. So it's very important that we, we remind ourselves of the words of the Master. When we read the words of the Master in correlation, in correlation with the Torah, the words of Moses, we get a better understanding. Much better understanding. So when the Master Yeshua was speaking about if you ask for a fish, will your, you know, will, your, will your father give you a snake? He's talking about God here. He's saying that if you ask God to give you a fish, and God is a good God, He is not demented, then, then why would He not give you a fish? Why would He give you a snake? He said if your father, evil father, on, the, on this earth is willing to give you a good gift, is willing to give you a fish, what about the Father in heaven? That's, by the way, the narrow door. The narrow door is the door of the Father in the heaven. And it says, many are following the wide, wide road to destruction. Well, who are these people following the wide road? Well, I guess the, the, the people who are following the wide road are those that are saying that I'm a victim. I'm, you know, I'm being persecuted. My skin is the wrong color. They're persecuting me because I'm black or because I'm Mexican or because uh, I'm Chinese. I don't know, some, some other variety. So therefore, that victim mentality is putting a lot of people down. Uh, Rabbi Benaiah saying, I've reached the top of company as a marketing director and have helped many do likewise. The promises apply to me, us. Oh, absolutely, Brook Shem, Master Shiva, great and, and great and, as, and, and more you shall go. So it's very important to understand that, that we, whose decree, whose decree do you want to follow? Do you want to follow the demented God? The one who forgot his previous words now he tells you that there's no sabbath there is no food laws there is no uh, you know laws of living or do you want to follow the god that remembers so when we had israelites whining and complaining in egypt so let's come back to that story we had egypt, egypt you know in egypt all these israelites whining and complaining yada 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 and then god and then of course, we have the priesthood there. Aaron, you know, the Aaronic priesthood was there, 
Aaron's there praying, Moses goes there praying, then what does God say? I remember my covenant. Then when they are there, whilst they are whining and complaining, God remembers the covenant. God says, I remember my covenant, I haven't forgotten, I'm not demented, I haven't forgotten it, and I'm going to rescue you all, I'm going to bring you all out. And then when Moses goes to them, what do you think they say to Moses? Do you think they welcome him on a red carpet? Moses, welcome. Hey, great man, you, know, you come from all, the, all that other country, came from Saudi Arabia. Oh, we, we like to welcome you. No. They gave Moses the, the, the tongue thrashing. The same kind of tongue thrashing I got from some of the people over here in North America. Oh, his color is wrong. Oh, he's, he's got no curly hair. Oh, how can he be from God? All that baloney I got from people over here as well, by the way. I didn't change, I didn't change a single ounce of who I am and what I do for God. It doesn't change a single ounce of that. And I got all of that thrashing too, by the way, from some people here in North America. His color is wrong, he's got no curly hair, how can he be part of uh, Israel, blah blah blah, and on it goes. And so when Moses went, Moses got the tongue thrashing of his life. Moses got so much tongue thrashing that Moses didn't know what to do. Moses was like, my goodness, have I come for the waste of my time for these kind of people? I'd rather stay with my family in, in, in Saudi Arabia, where I was living happily with my wife and children. And, and then Moses is, is so disheartened that Moses actually runs away from Egypt. Let's not forget the reality of what happened with Moses. Moses went to Egypt, got a tongue threshing, got a whining. These people then accused Moses of being a murderer and Moses ran away from Egypt. Originally, remember originally, Moses ran away from Egypt because they said he's a murderer. He killed somebody. And, the, and, the, and all your you know, Jewish theological seminaries, Jewish meaning Orthodox Judaism, and the baloney that comes out of it, what do they say? Oh, he used the, we used the Shem Hamvarash, he used the sacred name. No, Moses did not use the sacred name, he used his sacred fist. Moses' sacred fist was so tight that he knocked this person and his senses out, killed him. And when Moses knocked him out with his sacred fist, now you can make up whatever you like. Now you can say, oh no, he killed him with using God's name, like some kind of magic baloney. God's name is not a magic bullet. You know, they, they, these people sounded like, you know, these Ashkenazis, they sounded like God's name was some magic bullet. Oh, he, he said the name and he got buried into the sand. Come on, you know, stop this nonsense. Stop this BS. Total baloney. You know, it's just, it, let's be honest about what did Moses do. Moses used his sacred fist, boom. <laughs> That's the end of that man. Now let me bury him with my own hands. So, now you can make up whatever story you like. So Moses was, remember, remember, it says that Moses was a humble man. But it also says, it also says that when Moses goes into a rage, what happens? His sacred fist comes into action. So let's not, let's not pretend because Moses was a warrior, by the way. <laughs> yeah, knockout. Moses was a warrior. He was no, he was from a Levite clan. If you have forgotten, if all of, if everybody, including Ashkenazis, have forgotten who Levites were, we are talking about the same Levite, same Levite, our forefather, who went to Shechem and knocked the, you know, uh, knocked the winds out of all the people over there. Remember that Levite who went with Shimon? Shimon and Levi went together into Shechem and what did they do? They knocked the wind out of Shechem and they killed all the males and they, and they took everything else. And what did the father say to them? You bad boys. And the father cursed them down. The father cursed them down. He said, you bad boys, both of you. Both of you went over there and you set this whole thing up and you deceived these people and you went and, you know, so he actually, <clears throat> if you think about it for a second, Jacob's response was very negative to his sons. It wasn't a positive response. It wasn't an uplifting response and saying, hey, great, you did a great thing. He didn't say that. But God didn't, God didn't knock him down. God didn't say, oh, these are bad boys. This did, did thing wrong. God, God, God was silent in the whole thing. Complete silence. And then, when does God speak about the Levites? God remained silent. God didn't say one word in the positive or one word in the negative about that incident. God didn't say they were deceivers. Yes, they did deceive the people. Let's be honest about it. Let's be honest that both Levi and Shimon, they did deceive the, the, the Shechem crowd. Because they said to Shechem, that if you circumcise, then we'll marry our sister to you. And they didn't, up, they didn't uphold their promise, because they were deceiving them. 
Now, <coughs> unfortunately, or fortunately, this deception comes from the father. It comes from the father because didn't the father deceive? Uh, yes, the father deceived the brother as well. And you might say that the father didn't want him to deceive, but then did deceive. Jacob had two natures, by the way. Jacob had two natures until we understand. Because Jacob, uh, uh, there was Jacob, there was Israel. Let's have the question in Israel. If, if Jacob came to Israel, then why does Jacob? Because when the Bible calls him Jacob, his old nature is there. The old man, the deceiver, by the way. The one who deceived his brother. Very much. It's right there in front of your eyes, if you can see. And so what curses his sons down. He doesn't put a blessing on his sons at that point and say, No. You, you're going to bring trouble to go to people. Well, Bobby and one didn't say. They were God speak behinds. God speaks on behalf of the Levites when one Levite stood up. And when the Levites, then God speak. Put ever laugh, no black one, no one can change this. And they're going to shalom. That occurred in two places. The first place it occurred in, at the golden calf idolatry, when Israel was busy dancing around with the golden calf and making the golden calf speak with magic, mumbo jumbo. When they make that golden cow speak with their magic at that, that time, and as, as do many Ishkenazis today, they try to make an a, a, a idol speak, and a statue they make golden, they try to make it speak by using, by using their mumbo jumbo. And you know, you would have read about that if you haven't, I encourage you to read it and see that they did the same thing as well in, in um, uh, Eastern Europe. And so when they do that, well, well uh, children of Israel, children of Israel did that too. And so, Levites stood up at that time. And Moses said, who is for God? Then the Levites stood up. We are for God. They all stood on the side of Moses. And Moses said, Moses said, take care of them. Bring your holy fists out. That's time for the holy fist. No more this nonsense about, oh, use the name to kill people. No, he said, bring your holy fist out and your holy swords. Kill them all. All these idolaters. And they were all killed. The Levites stood up and did that act, by the way. And today, if you say that act, today, if you talk about that act, it will, be, it will be seem like it's murder. But it was a, a decree from above, a holy decree from above, that the Levites had to do that. Hard as it may be, their own brothers, their own sisters, their own flesh and blood. You know, these are people that were in idolatry, dancing with the golden calf and, you know, jiggly woo, boogly doo. <laughs> They're doing all of that. And they were having all sorts of, you know, all sorts of sex. That's what was happening at that time. All sorts of, you know, sex was going on and, and you know, so much idolatry was going on that Levi stood up and said, okay, we're going to take care of this. Because Moses has said to take care of it. So they took care of it. And God took notice. God took notice of that. God didn't say, oh, well, you know, the, the Levites shouldn't have stood up and used their holy swords for this holy work. God said they did the right thing. They stopped the plague. And then who stood up to stop the plague eventually? You remember who stood up? Phinehas. Phinehas is, is, is the name is written in the annals of history. Phinehas stood up. He was a Levite and God said, now God stood up and said, you know what? My blessing is going to be upon these people for the rest of their lives, for their generations and generations to come. And by the way, this man speaking today happens to be from that generation. Believe it or not, <laughs> you can either take it, or you can either loathe it, or you can love it. You have three choices, you can take it, you can loathe it, you can love it. Because this man is from that generation, I don't care what anybody else says. I will give two hoots about it. Because Simon Altev is from Moses' generation, Baruch Hashem Yahweh for that. So therefore, he stood up, God stood up with his decree, the God that has no, no dementia. Because if I go down the church, they'll have dementia. They will say, oh, well, you know, priesthood is finished. Sorry, God didn't say that. God didn't say priesthood is finished. God said that the priesthood will be re-established. It's only temporarily put away. It's only temporarily on the block because we don't have our land. We don't have, we don't have our homes. We don't have our temple. But God will restore everything back. So now we have a different issues going on. Well, are we going to get a temple? Are we not going to get a temple? You know, we, we get this all the time from, from churches, the theologians in the churches, always talking about, you know, they are wrestling with verses. Uh, are they going to have a temple? Are they not going to have a temple? Maybe they're not going to have it. Maybe it's, a phys Maybe it's just a, 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 how to say, a type. Maybe it's only symbolic. Maybe the temple is only symbolic. Maybe it's not literal. 
So there's a lot of people trying to do away with our restoration and our temple. Because the hard reality is this, that the book of Ezekiel, although it's put to the back burner, back pages of history, and nobody wants to study it, and those that do, those that study the book of Ezekiel, they come to the conclusion, maybe the temple was already done dusted. Maybe Ezekiel spoke about a temple in the past. It was done, it was created, it was done, it was dust, you know, it was made, it was destroyed, end of. But what's forgotten is Ezekiel's temple has never come to fruition in the way Ezekiel described it. It has never happened. It is still yet future. And a lot of people today are wrestling with that, um, that prophecy saying many of the Christians just simply ignore it. They don't accept it. They don't accept that Ezekiel's words are true. They say that their temple is only uh, a type. It's a sim it's symbology only. It's, not, it's symbolic. It's not real. And some of the other people, some of the other people, perhaps, you know, who believe or teach Torah or believe in God, they also say same, similar things, that that was an old thing. So, very few of us, by the way, very few of us, non-demented people, we believe that the temple is yet future. And it will come to pass. And the Levites will be restored under the tutelage of the Messiah, Yeshua himself. So this is very important. This is very important that, that we understand that. That we are yet into the future. And Master Yeshua spoke about those things uh, over and over again. He spoke about them. He spoke about the present temple. You know, if you read the book of Matthew, He spoke about the present temple and the destruction of it. Matthew 24 spoke, spoke about the destruction of it at that point. It says in the future, near future, this building will be destroyed and every storm will be, will be thrown down. Well, if, you know, I went to Israel uh, with Rabbi Kiva not too long ago, and we, we definitely saw that there was no stone standing of the temple. We saw that. But if you believe, but if you believe that the temple wall somehow, you know, in, in, in old Jerusalem is standing, <laughs> I'm afraid you've got a problem because the, the Master Yeshua said, no, no storm will be standing and be unturned. It will be thrown down. Well, if, if you happen to just leave one western wall up, and you know, the, 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 the border up, the border walls, then the Yeshua's prophecy never came to pass. Really, if you, if you believe, if, you know, most Christians, most Christians believe that, that Jesus' words are true. Then they, then they do a counter turn, then they become demented. Then they suddenly go back and reverse, reverse up and they say, Oh yeah, but those, that wall is of the, western wall is of the temple. Well, if the western wall is of the temple, then the Master Yeshua is lied. Because the western wall of the temple is not the temple. It's a wall of the Herodian fortress where the Legion X was housed, which we know from history. Legion X was housed over there. And Legion X did all sorts of nasty things over there. You know, so, so let's not forget that. So Legion X is the place of the Western Wall. So if we're going to look at the Western Wall and say that's the temple, I would say no, that's not the temple wall. Nothing to do with the temple. It is to do with Israel, but not to do with the temple. That is part of Israel, but the temple was totally somewhere else. Where, uh, where Rabbi Kifa saw there was no temple, there's flat fields. <laughs> it's fields, it's like wheat growing over there. <laughs> so I saw that, I took a picture of that place with wheat growing over there. I was like, well, there you have it. There you have it, that none of this garbage that comes out of Christianity's uh, doctrines and Judaism's doctrines, all garbage. That there's a temple, there's a, a wall on there, and you know, this is the th you know, wall of the temple, and everybody goes and no. There's no such thing. In fact, the prophecy that was given by the prophets that the temple will have fields growing over there. It was so peaceful and so quiet and these fields are growing there and I took a picture from the top of a hill of these fields with, with you know, different gra grains growing over there just as the prophet had dictated that it will have grains over there. Well, you can either believe the prophet, you can believe the Messiah, or you can believe a modern day theology that says that the western wall is of the temple, yet we know that it is not. So, this is the problem. Who do you believe? Do you believe God or do you believe man? I myself would rather believe God. And somebody in this room said that they will follow what God says. 
Well, it's nice to say that. But if God says, then, then, then whose mouth should that come out of? Because God's not going to come speak to you directly, is He? He's not going to speak to you. Because you know, if, when, you, when you use the words, I believe what God says, well, what do you mean by that? What do you mean when God says? Is God going to speak to you directly? Is He going to give you a lecture on every Saturday? Is He going to sit you down? Is He going to say, Joe, come here, sit down. I'm going to give you a lecture now. This is what you're going to do. God doesn't do that, by the way. So God has a Bible. God has written words. God has written words and God's words are written. And who did God say are my priesthood? Who did God say are my teachers? But they are God's voice. And if you don't hear their voice, you know, if the priest tells you that this is what you're supposed to do, I'm not talking about a Catholic priest, I'm talking about a Levite priest, and if you don't hear his voice, are you really hearing God's voice? Or are you demented as well? Maybe you are demented too. Just like the churches mostly around us, demented. They have a demented God who forgot, who forgot everything. He forgot all the promises to Israel. He forgot everything that He said. But no, we are not. So, whose judgment are we going to follow? Because we are told, we are told to appoint officers and judges. In the book of Deuteronomy, in this part, it says, You will make judges and officers in all your gates, which Yahweh of power gives you throughout your tribes. And they shall judge the people with righteous judgment. In other words, all twelve tribes are supposed to make judges and officers. Well, if you don't have the twelve tribes today, that's a reality. Reality 101. The twelve tribes are not in Israel. They're in the diaspora. Well, then what judges and what officers? So who's left? Who's left after that? The only judges that you've got left today are from the priestly tribe. That's a revelation. If, 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 if you don't believe it, that's a revelation and a half. The only judges that are standing today are from the priestly tribes. Because we are to make judges by the twelve tribes and they don't exist. In other words, they don't exist in the land, but they do outside. And absolutely, Rabbi Kipa, what was the criteria for judges and officers? And I think they need to read that next. What is the criteria for that? And, and then God makes it very clear what you're to do and what you're not to do. And it doesn't stop. It doesn't stop there. In fact, God goes so far in the, in the passages of Deuteronomy, in the same book, God goes further. And God tells you that when you're going to have problems, who are you going to go to, to to reconcile those problems? He tells you. And it's in no uncertain terms that, you know, we, we, according to God and according to history, we ran into many problems. Because God had already dictated that we'll run into problems. And God said that when, when you run into problems and you don't know what you do, well, let me, let me tell you the words of God. These are not my words, they are His words. Deuteronomy chapter 19 verse 17. It says, Then both the men between whom the controversy is, shall stand before Yahweh, before the Kohanim and the judges, which shall be in those days. Well, in 2018, I don't see in Pensacola, Florida, Ephraim is not here in Pensacola, Florida. The ten tribes are not living here, but the Kohen is. So according to these verses, if you have a controversy, that's the person you go to. Unless, unless you have another Kohen in the gate, somewhere else, then you can go to him, but it says this. This is the Kohen you are supposed to go to. And he says that the judges shall make diligent inquiry, and behold, if the witness be a false witness, and have testified falsely against his brother. So it speaks about, it speaks about, now this can't be just taken for capital punishment. Because some people will say, well this is just regarding capital punishment. No, it's not. It's regarding everything in your life. Everything and everything. La la da, everything. La di da, the whole works. Everything. You know, if you have a controversy, that's, that's small or great. You're supposed, to, you're supposed to go to the coin in the gate. Period. God didn't bring His coin in the gate to be mocked, to be ridiculed, to be called names, to be spat upon. And yeah, you can do that, but you know, it's, it doesn't matter. It's not going to do nothing to me. All you do is bring curses to yourself. Because what does happen? What happened to... Do you remember what happened to the... And there was an incident in the Bible where uh, Prophet Elisha, who was a Levite as well, he was called names. He was called bold man, bold man. You know, they were they were they were they were shouting, 
uh, what they thought was a joke. You know, these, these, what the Bible terms kids usually means young men. So these young men were, were shouting abuse at Prophet Elisha. And they were calling him names, you bold man, you bold man, like this. And what did the Prophet Elisha do? He just turned around and just prayed. And what happened? A bear came out, and a bear came out with a holy, with a holy, you know, bear pose. And the holy bear pose killed all these young men. Not a nice thing. But you know, this is what happens when you speak against the decrees that God has set. Seems harsh, doesn't it? That the holy bear comes out instead of the holy bread. <laughs> yeah, that's really funny. <laughs> instead of holy bread, holy bear came out. <laughs> holy bear, let's get out of here. <laughs> it's so funny. <laughs> but that's what happened. <laughs> you, know, you speak against the Kohen and the gay, your, it's your butt <laughs> and the bear chasing you. So be careful. Be careful with a spiritual bear that comes against you. Because it won't be me chasing you, that's for sure. <laughs> I'm not coming to chase you. But be careful with your words. The holy alligator, yeah. The holy alligator will come out of Florida. <laughs> Heaven forbid. So we've got, we got to be really careful with that because there's alligators in here as well. <laughs> so it was really funny because, you know, I was, I was looking at what the Israelites did. It's whining and whining and whining and then God says, I'm going to take you out. You're whining. And then what do they do? They don't stop whining when they come out. They continue to whine. So if whining is in your blood, then whining will continue. But it is a choice. We have a choice to whine and we have a choice not to whine. And I'm not talking about whining and dining. <laughs> you know, that, that kind of whining and dining. So you can choose to whine about it, complain about it, or you can choose to ask God to make it better for you. I would rather choose the latter. Oh yeah, the holy cow, Rabbi Kiva. <laughs> the holy cow will come out of, uh, or the holy bull will come out of uh, Texas. You know, the longhorn. You know, if you want the lo the holy longhorn chasing you, then yeah, speak words of mal 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 words to the to the tribe of Judah over there. So we gotta be careful because, you know, it's it's gonna be for us is very detrimental the speech. So what the Master Yeshua was saying in 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 real essence, and I take you to his words in chapter 6, and I rem remind you of what he said in the prayer, and they asked him, how, how do we pray? And he said, pray that our Abba in the Shemaim, our Father in the heavens, holy be your name, set apart be your name, your kingdom come, your, your will be done in earth as it is in the Shemaim in the heaven. So he says, your will be done in the earth. Well, if you're going to keep saying every day when you whine, you're going to keep saying, I am, you know, I am a victim. If you're going to keep reminding yourself that you're a victim and you're going to stand on the streets of New York and you're going to say, I'm cursed, then let that be on to you. Or you can be the better man and you can say, let that be on to God. What God said about me, I am a, I'm a victor. I'm victorious. I am the head and not the tail. You have two choices before you. You can take the choice that or you can take the choice this. You know, so what, what do you want to be? And so the Master Yeshua clarifies that for us a little bit when he tells us that when we pray that God's will be done, then we should stop whining and complaining. That's the idea. And when he talks about that give us this day our daily bread, and he says, and we forgive our debts as we forgive our debtors. The only time that God can forgive us is if we forgive others first. You know, if I can't forgive others who've done wrong against me, then why would God forgive me? Because if I'm unmerciful, then God will be unmerciful to me as well. So it's very important to understand that point. And forgiveness is not just by the mouth, as we already know it, because. Uh, you know, one of the questions that Christians ask, and Christians do as well, one of the questions they say is, if somebody's wronged me, and I seek forgiveness, and I forgive them, and I stay in the church, I never go out of the church, or out of my home, but I forgive them, are they really forgiven? For something, you know, if somebody's done some wrong to you, 
uh, and then you forgive them, you're going to have to go speak to them. You're going to have to go speak to that person. If uh, another person you know, holds a grudge against you because you did something wrong to them, you have to go and ask and, and tell them that you forgive them for their, for their sins or whatever is, is you're holding against them. So that means you have to go there. Or if you have done wrong, if you have wronged somebody, Christians again ask that question. If I have wronged somebody and I say to Jesus, I forgive them, is it is the forgiveness done? And the answer is no, because you have to go to them still. So this is a problem with theology. Theology comes to stark reality when we are talking about a living God versus a demented God. You can either have the demented God that forgets, that you know changes every five minutes. Uh, he doesn't remember what he said to the children of Israel. He doesn't even remember what he said to Abraham. Or you can serve the living God with what words he spoke. And his words for children of Israel were always positive words of blessings provided. There was an if. There was an if then else condition. The if condition was that you obey God's voice. Now, unless you are going to tell me that, Simon, I sit every Saturday and I have the speaker connected in my room and God speaks from the Shamaim, from the heavens, and I hear Him, unless you tell me that, the only voice you're going to hear of God is the, or the, the ones that He's decreed as His teachers on the earth, the people He anointed. And if, if those are the people, and yes, God is sovereign, God can anoint anybody He likes on the earth today. And yes, they can speak out of a church pulpit too. I will not deny that. It is God's sovereignty to do as He pleases. But initially, originally, that God has already devised His teachers and His people. Outside of that, He can use anybody He likes. I mean, God can use a donkey to speak. And God did use a donkey to speak. So if God can use a donkey to speak, that means... Even though the donkey to us may appear to be dumb, or only say one word, e -o, you know, there's only one word we hear from him, but God can make him have speech that we understand. That is God's prerogative, that is God's sovereignty, and that is God's mercy. I accept that. I accept that God can make a donkey speak. I accept that God can make uh, an animal speak and I accept that God can choose another man from the nations to be his voice as well I accept that I have no problem with that because it is in God's sovereignty to do that but God will never do away with his original decrees in which he established his priesthood he will never do away with those so we got to understand that the Master Yeshua although he is a type of high priest, type. I use the word type, focuses on type, emphasis on the word type. But he is not a Levite, by the way. And there is no such thing as two different priesthoods. That, you know, the, the, the demented old and the demented new. No, there is no such thing. The Master Yeshua is Yahweh in person and he stands as a mediator but as a type of high priest. But the high priest is a typology of a king, a righteous king, who is Melech Zadik. Melech Zadik in the Hebrew means righteous king. We must not take those words and make something out of it that doesn't exist. So with that, I'm going to leave you and I, and I hope that you understand that Yahweh's words are eternal and final. There is no other word that we can supersede with it. The Bible is complete, done, dusted, written. We have it in front of us. It's not going to be uh, re-given at Mount Sinai. It's already been given. And the uh, disciples of Master Shu already written their books as well. We have them before us. The New Testament, Brit Khadacha. So we cannot now uh, invent new things. We must follow the words of God. And there lies our blessings and their life will lie. And it says, Justice, justice shall you pursue. And when you do that, when you pursue justice, God then 
prefix, you know, he then post texts that as well, and he tells you what that actually means, because he clarifies it that when you will pursue justice, justice meaning Torah, by the way, simply means Torah. When you live by the Torah, that you will live. Live doesn't just mean live. Live doesn't mean that I live and I have 15 diseases on me. That doesn't mean living, by the way. Because when you have 15 diseases on you, then something is wrong in your actions. And yes, you know, we can get the common cold, and we can get the flu, and we can get these kind of things that are temporary. But if you're, if you're dealing with serious illnesses, blood pressure, you know, diabetes, you know, all these kind of serious illnesses, then I'm not saying that you're a sinner and you're doing it. I'm not saying it's because you're a sinner. But I'm saying that that kind of living is what God was speaking about. Is that live means to live free, to live whole, and not to live with 15 illnesses where you take 30 tablets every day. That's not living, by the way. That's just barely making it. So we have to ask ourselves that question, what kind of life am I living? Am I living where I have to take 13 different tablets every day to survive? Or am I living the life that God has ordained for me? So from today, you must start telling yourself that and reminding yourself. Because if you have become demented, then that's a problem too. Because you can become demented. You can forget. And you can say, well, I don't know what to do now. But I encourage you to remove dementia from yourself and remind God what God said about you. That you are blessed. You are not cursed. You'll be blessed when you go out of the city. You'll be blessed when you come back into the city. And you are the head. You're not the tail. You are a lender. You're not a borrower. These are the things that you need to tell yourself daily. Every day when you wake up, you need to tell yourself that so that you don't become demented. Because when you do these things, then you're releasing the benefits, the blessings that God has ordained and commanded for us, commanded for you and me, but we have to release those. And I've given you the method to release them. It's up to you now what you do with them. You can either go, go, you know, be with the demented God, and I've got nothing, you know, I've got nothing against Christians. I love Christians equally. I've got nothing against pastors, even though I call some of them dogs, which they are. Uh, but I love them as well. But I only wish that they, they taught the word of God not the words of their uh, unrighteous forefathers. That's my only wish for them. And with that, I leave you. I love you and I leave you. You have a blessed Sabbath. You have a great day ahead. And uh, Rabbi Kiva, on to you. Tada. Shabbat Shalom. Shalom Shalom. Tada HaKohin, son of Aaron for your great instruction as usual guidance that is practical practicality is what we need today 2018 going forward not none of the poltergeist theology out here that you're going to get from Judaism you know Judaism want to teach you how to make a golem <laughs> I mean what good is a golem going to do making a golem part what good is that going to do today in 2018 can anybody tell me what, 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 is, how, how, what is that going to help you is that Go to work for you and and pay your bills on time. <laughs> My goodness, you know, Akohi. Uh, if I can be heard, can I get a one? I want to make sure I'm not talking to myself before I go any further. Akohi, hey, to top of that, Akohi, son of Aaron. You know, uh, you 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 made a point that I, two points that I want to address going forward that has happened in my life these past six days of labor. One point is this: is that you you know you you mentioned that you know you, you know that. Uh, you know about the pastor factor actually we had a pastor phone into us this week here at forever israel and uh i said those same words hakohi your words come right out of my mouth i said those same words to that pastor you know number one i really guarded and warned him against what he was teaching as he said he was trying to bring his flock into uh compliance with the torah and he's teaching in the torah i, I warned him to be very careful about you know what he teaches his people going forward because he needs to teach them the right thing so first thing i did was i pointed him to the hidden truth break scrolls and i encouraged him to begin to understand that for himself first before he goes out here and misteaches 
you know, you know, the congregation is already lost in Christianity. And I did it to him in love, and I, he really, he really, he really appreciated our, our conversation because I didn't run him under the bus. Didn't tell him, you know, you know, uh, uh, you know, most people without proper understanding will will just run Christians under the bus. And as you heard from the son of Aaron's lecture, that's not our agenda. We 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 have a high respect for our religions. And the people to choose the choice to choose and hang in these religions. I'm pretty sure the majority of you pe people in this room listen to the MP3 as well. You still have family members, friends, and loved ones that are in these religions: Christianity, Catholicism, and whatever else is out there. You know, Pentecostal, Baptist. I'm pretty sure you all have family. I mean, I mean that's the take. And as you heard from the son of Aaron, which he may have been slandered here, there, and everywhere on YouTube because they did they do that. You know. And you leave these people to it, but they'll tell you that it's a divisive group, we become some kind of cult. No, we're here to love all people. You see, we're here to have a high respect for all of humanity, which is, at the end of the day, it's, it's the Abba's creation, it's the Master's creation anyway. We all were created in His images. You know, so again, I think it's very important that we do understand that going forward. So the conversation with this pastor was just that very point, is that he teaches properly. And, you know, I encouraged him kind of to kind of leave the teaching role. But, you know, a lot of these pastors that come into an understanding or revelation of Paul Roth, you know, they have a, this heavy burden upon them to make things right. You know, because they have led these people astray, you know, what I've been hearing is that they want to make things right. So I, I pointed him to the fact that if he considers himself Israel, that, you know, he has to look at, you know, the true teachers of Israel first and get an understanding before he can even move further to begin to, you know, teach others. He must begin to execute and demonstrate Torah within his life, get compliance to where he can understand and where he can, not only just with his words, but he can show through his actions on how you need to live. So, encouraging words we're giving to this pastor. Hopefully he'll take heed. Instruction was given out. Hopefully he'll follow through with it. Get the hint if he breaks scrolls and begin to really understand it for himself so that he can, you know, truly, you know, uh, uh, be of assistance to his congregation. But I, I, I really, you know, really guarded him against even teaching going further because I, I began to explain to him that he's already in a bad situation as far as leading these people astray. So you don't need to add bad on top of bad, you know, so again... Yeah. This is why I encourage you to kind of just lay low for a little while, contact the son of Aaron, you know, really get instruction for yourself, direction, understanding, so that you, you, you know, you can fix yourself. Don't worry about fixing those others. And I try to re really hone in that point, but I guess with Christianity, they're so caught up on saving the world that they realize, that they, that they, they, they fail to realize that they need to be worried about saving self. Not the whole world. You know, not, you know, Tom and Harry, but you need to deal with yourself. Leave Tom and Harry to it. Fix yourself first. But, you know, that's, uh, you know, that's, you know, that's a tough pill for a lot of Christians to swallow. It's because they've been indoctrinated. They've been conditioned to do what? Go out and save the world. Believe me, I've been there. I'm talking to you from experience. On Friday nights, I like to be doing other things, but I'm here on street corners passing out tracts as a Christian back in the day. I remember those times. Telling everybody that they're going to hell. How many of you know what I'm talking about? You don't sympathize with me. You empathize because you know you were doing that too. You're passing out tracts. You tell everybody they're going to hell. <laughs> you know, you better believe on Jesus. You have to say this prayer. If you die today, you'll go to hell. My goodness. So that's what his conditioning was. So, you know, this is one of the great blessings of coming out of these religions. Don't see it as a bad thing, but see it as a good thing because you can empathize with these people and you can get on their level and say, okay, look, in love, I'm going to tell you this. Here, you do this. I'm not running you under the bus. I'm not telling you going to hell, but I am telling you, you need to line up with the Creator and this is how you do it. There's a, there's a method to it. There's a pattern. In the kingdom of the Most Highest, there's order. Follow these orders and you'll do yourself well. If a nurse messes up doctor's orders, my goodness, you can kill a patient. You can kill someone. 
if you don't take the proper orders down right, and that has happened time and time again. Sometimes even doctors write the wrong orders, and they kill people. They don't do it intentionally, it's accident, but it happens. You know, so again, I was explaining this to my daughter as well. You know, some you know you know you, you get all this education sometimes, but sometimes you can you can muck up and make some bad situations happen. And I explained to her about the situation where a doctor had surgery one morning, and he went in and he he took the leg off of the lady when he was supposed to take the arm off of the lady, and on the other lady he took the the arm off when he was supposed to take the leg because she had diabetes. That happens. Errors do occur. And you can have all the book knowledge in the world, but if you don't pay attention to detail, what good is it going to do you? You'll still have lasting effects on people. I don't care how many titles you have behind your name. It doesn't matter. But paying attention to detail does matter. So the point with the pastor is, is, is so spot on. Do you see the compassion and love that, uh, and, and loving kindness that is being taught to you and exhibited to you by the son of Aaron? This is how we were to be with humanity at the end of the day. We're not trying to put up more walls. And I'll tell you the next bit that was so instructional. You know, my daughter is freshly new to America, 14 years old. Now she's begun to interact with the American students, American children over here in America, American schools. And, you know, she had her first interaction the other day. An orient, freshman orientation to high school. And Rupa Shem Master Jesus, she's already have a friend in her school who's from China. He's been here a year. He's been in that school a year. So I encouraged her to, you know, make contact with this boy. He's from China. You know, see, this is your, you know, you know this is your homeland here. Contact him and, and get his viewpoint on how he's seen America in this past year. And do you know, son of Aaron, do you know the first thing that he told her? I said, well, what did this guy tell you about how he's getting on with America? Do you know the first thing that he said? He said this. He said, there's a lot of discrimination against me here. They're discriminating. So my daughter comes up to me and asks me this these past six days. She said, Dad, what is discrimination? What is this? My daughter is, is, is as green as a fig leaf. When it comes to that, she's like, what is this discrimination? And my friend from China tells me, the student tells me that, you know, he's been discriminated against. Wow. Discrimination. It's one of the first lessons that I had to teach my daughter. I told my daughter, don't worry about that. It's going to be, it, you're going to have discrimination wherever you go world over. You just, she didn't know the face of discrimination, what it really was. But I began to explain to her, even in China, you were discriminated against. They discriminate against you by grade. You don't make a particular grade, you're discriminated against. You're not considered smart, you're discriminated against. You're a girl in China, you're discriminated against. But just like the son of Aaron was talking about, when he was using the word dispensation, he didn't know what that word meant. I thought about my daughter and what she was talking about. Well, what is what is this discrimination that my Chinese friend, my Chinese classmate is telling me about? As he's been in America a year, and he he told her, "Oh yeah, they discriminate against me." Wow, fourteen, fifteen year old boy, discrimination. They discriminate against him. So she's asking, "What is this discrimination? What is this?" Sad to say, but we live in a world, we live in societies where that, that happens. And discrimination just doesn't come to you in the color of, 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 of uh, you know, the color of one's skin. So we had to deal with that. During the Son of Aaron's lecture as well, Liam Hochma brought this to my attention. The Ruach HaKadosh, the Holy Spirit. So I wrote it down, Rabbi Benia. It's this, the work is completed, but the walk is unaccomplished. The son of Aaron has completed the work. What is the work that I'm talking about? 
the work is completed. You have the instructions given to water down to you in Similac baby formula form. The work is completed. The hidden truth he breaks grows. That's completed. The work is completed. The walk is uncompleted. As you all look at it and examine yourselves, the, the walk is still incomplete. How many of you in this room can say that your walk is complete? <laughs> the, the walk is still incomplete. We're still working at the walk, but the work is done. The work is complete. But it's the walk, Mishmaha. This is one of the another beauty of the exile. Another beauty of the dispersion. Is we, we, we get to work at, you know, the incomplete. What happens in school when you get an incomplete? You must complete the incomplete, right? So we we're steadily working at completing the incomplete, getting better at doing it. And every Shabbat, and you pick up those hidden trophy break scrolls. And for those of you who are new to this room, you're new to YouTube, and you don't know what the hidden trophy break scrolls are, they're a Bible that you can purchase on Amazon. Hebrew Roots Bible, better than any Bible out there. So any of you, you claim to be theologians, uh, you know, you claim to be, you know, you know, wanting to obey the voice of God, you claim to, you know, wanting to obey God. I'll finish with the rest. The, 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 there was someone in the room, he came in earlier, and you're right, son of Aaron, he said this. He said, I only believe in God. But do you know what he said earlier in his statement too, son of Aaron? He said this. He said, I only believe in God, but I don't believe in the Bible. <laughs> I was over here laughing at that. And I had to let this meditate in while I was laughing, while I was over here, you know, shaking the ribs up over here. He says, I believe in God, or he or she, I don't know what it was, but the person said, I believe in God, but I don't believe in the Bible. Now, I began to reason within myself, how do you do that? How... How can you do that? And then the son of Aaron said in his lecture, I don't think the person was still here. He said this, well, maybe you have a microphone hooked up, you know, stereo sound <laughs> into your room, and you have a direct connection with heaven, and God speaks to you through that microphone. Because how else, I'm thinking, well, how else can you, you believe in God? You see, but again, because it goes back to this question that I have here. Early bird is how do you? Because the Torah tells us justice, justice. You must pursue. Well, if I'm to pursue justice, then how? When I, when I, what does pursue mean to you? I'm thinking, you know, pursuit. I'm thinking you on a horse because I like westerns. You on a horse and you know they're going, <laughs> you chasing somebody down on a horse, or you know you're in pursuit, you in a. You know, I'm thinking of policemen. When they're in pursuit of somebody, you know, they're in their vehicles and they have lights on, sirens going, and they're following, uh, you know, you know. Or, you know what first came to mind? I thought of pursuit. How many of you, maybe you remember this too, son of Aaron, that moment when they had the OJ pursuit. You remember that in L.A.? When you have all these police cars following OJ Simpson and his wife, Suburban or SUV. Y'all remember that pursuit? So I'm thinking of this, I'm like, pursue. So, justice, justice, we must pursue. We must go after justice, right? We must, yeah, that was a slow pursuit. You're right, y'all hear woman of a kid. So when you finally pursue justice, and justice becomes the O.J. Simpson moment, you know, <laughs> Reuben Benaiah is thinking of a, uh, Benaiah, he's thinking of a bloodhound pursuit. Oh, yeah, you see, you get the bloodhound to sniffing, and he picks up the scent, and then he finally finds what he's looking for, the bloodhounds. And then, so what do you do then? You pursue, you, 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 you find it, then what do you do when you pursue justice and you find it? What's the next step? See, this is why I have the question of this. You pursue justice, you, you corral justice, you handcuff justice. Now what do you do with justice? How do you justice? That's the question that I have. 
How do you how do you justice? You see? How do you do that? How you justice? You see? That's an important question, right? How do you justice? I mean, think about it. This is something, you know, how, how do you do justice? You see? This is what we must understand going forward. Yeah, uh, from not speaking English to you here, please, please go somewhere else where you can get English. Here is a reality room. We, 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 we like to uh, keep everything real here and simple. Huh. Yeah. You see? You know, how, how do you do that? This is what you must understand. For some folks, this may be foreign. Because, you see, some folks want to live with the theology of poltergeist theology. They don't want practical. They want this poltergeist, oh, you must speak outside of the universe so I can understand. it. So you can tell me you're just confused? The son of Aaron said, without the statues, you could have never arrived at justice. Oh, indeed, I call you. Indeed, son of Aaron. So Torah is telling here, justice, justice, you must pursue. Well, when you find justice, then what do you do with it? How do you do justice? We pursue, but then we must do, right? You see? Son of Aaron goes on to say, but dementia has come on many, so there goes your justice. Oh, indeed, son of Aaron. Many today... And, I, and I'm talking with them under the umbrella of the Torah. You see, because what my lecture is about today, and it, and it piggybacks what the son of Aaron was saying, I always note that my, the words that come out of my mouth are his words, are, are, are my teacher's words, the son of Aaron's words. What better words to have come out of your mouth than that, right? Not the son of Aaron's words, they're Moses' words, because what does the laws of Moses say? These are the things that come out of my mouth. Everybody want to pursue justice. Everybody's in pursuit of justice. But think about this. Is it justice pursuit or perverted justice? <laughs> think about it. Is, it. is it really justice pursuit or perverted justice? Because, you know, many people will tell you world over, oh... I am a just and right man. Within the confines, under the umbrella of the Torah, they have Torah in their house, they may have menorahs in their house, they wear the zizis, they wear the fringes on the four corners of, the, of their garment. And they tell you, oh, I'm just. But yet, you beat your wife. Yet, you disrespect your wife. Yet, you're beating her down emotionally, physically. No, these are people that say they're in Torah. You disrespect your wife, and vice versa. You disrespect your husband. Yet you, you, you're in pursuit of justice, and you have found justice. Think about that now. I, there are many reports here in North America, people that so-called call themselves Jews, that are totally disrespecting their wives, beating on them physically, emotionally tearing them down. Yet you scream, "You are you're a just and you're a right man." In whose eyes? Maybe in your own. See, and this goes back to the question of of of, of how do you do justice? You see? How do you do justice? Yet we see time and time again. Yael, woman of attention, is how can you love God whom you cannot see, yet hate your brother whom you have not seen or live with? I mean, I mean, this is reality staring you in the face. You say you serve God, but you hate your husband. Who are you fooling? What kind of... You must be serving the God of the demented. Because the, 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 the God of the living said you to cling to your husband. I mean, let's get to reality 101 here. I mean, let's get to, 
Let's look at what's staring us in the face. Oh, I love God. Oh, I'm in service to God and God is blessing me. But you're cursing your husband down. You're cursing your wife down. Oh, justice, justice, I'll pursue it, Rabbi. Are you kidding me? You're in a room of realness here. This is reality staring you in the face. Real. Real life. Real people. Dealing with real situations. And overcoming real situations. If you follow the instruction. As the son of Aaron told you about the statute. What good is it to have justice when... I want you to note something in your studies. I want you to note every time justice is used in the Bible. Especially in our books, our ancient books. I, wa I want you to examine some. I want you to examine this. Every time you see the word justice, judgment is right next to it. Majority of the time. Close by. Like kissing cousins. Justice and judgment are a, a match made in heaven. See, you're going to see this, this study your Torah. You use Torah students. Just so, even more like this, this devil now is for a house. Real home. Can't live at home. Thank God. Bent it. Friend and old. Even in the you finally take it. But we're outside the world justice. And a lot of the justice today, I tell you, at, at best, it's just skewed. It's just twisted up. Justice today, well, what we see, is a shell of itself. Why do you think justice was repeated twice in our Torah? Justice, justice you must pursue. Not this ju justice that we see in the nations, but justice, justice. Ruk Master Yeshua, Master Jesus. For justice, justice, and not just justice. Because there's a lot of people in this nation that we're in right now. Let's look at it, Deuteronomy chapter 16, verse 20. I mean, the son of Aaron read it. Just as, just as you will pursue <laughs> that you may live. You see, a lot of it is, a lot of us, it's not our will to pursue justice. Think about it. This is why you get this, this is why you get perverted justice. Because their will is to pervert, their will is not to, to you know, pursue justice, justice. They're willing to just pursue justice. Their own justice in their own mind. Oh, my justice is, yeah, I can beat my wife and that's okay. I can just, you know, run under the bus. I can treat her like, you know, the slave that she is instead of the queen. But she better call me king. Where's justice in that? You treat your wife like a slave. Or vice versa. Your husband is treating you like the queen that you are. He took you under his wing. And he's made you the beautiful queen that you are. And you treat him like a slave. And you call him every other name under the bus. As you driving over him. Rolling over him. In that bus. Justice starts in the home. If there's no justice in the home, what's, what's leaving the house? Perverted justice, I would say. Not pursuit of justice. We have a long ways to go because just like the Mahukma told me, the work is completed. The son of Aaron has done the work, and it has taken him. Uh, it taken him what over what uh, ten years to complete the work. Well, ten plus. We'll throw in a couple of more years to make you know little changes here and there that need to be made, as revelation can be given out. The work is completed. The walk is incomplete. This is why I ask the question. How do you do justice? Because you can say it. What does me mean? Analyze your present and future. My Chinese dog. Because she's willing to make adjustment and adapt. Those two words. China has a different grades. That's like it's based on, and then will based on how you're graded. But here, it's a two different adjustment phase. It's a minimum that she's gonna have to go through. Think she'll be 
you study it online, you know, okay, uh, you know, the, the education online, man, she's, she's way behind. How many of you know people like that? They have book smarts, but they have no life education. Life education is important. How many of you understand that? You have to have education on life. Torah tells us that we, that we, you know, we, we just read it about life, right? We just read it. We just read it. Deuteronomy 16 and 20. Justice, justice, you will pursue that you may live. I get you. Man, what the... So, this is here you in the face. We're coming to the pool. We're up just as I'm down in the pool. Just gonna do all sit from that poltergeist, man. Oh, you, you, God, God is speaking. You come to the verse. Same, same reasons. Are you gonna go again? Well, I'm not moving. No God, crazy. Thing. The work is complete. The walk, the greatest. Beauty. In our condition, work has become what? complete. We walk at becoming complete because the work is already done. So we just have to walk at becoming complete. We become complete. Oh my nice shit. No, lying. The walk is just walking. We're not gonna actually doing this for you first. Think about that. Fortunately, let's pervert that this be But what do just no become to a bus you break. You must be very flexible. But you know, bro. So brother, I think I have a few pillows. That, that are, can help us. A fireman raises a woman, ladder. He is complete this beat. Think about it. I'll read it again. This scenario. Scenario of the situation. Fireman rescues. Maybe something can feel my benefit. Men are all the way to the end. I had a Ernie Joe Hunt, David Bell. I'm trying to hock it. I sell. People. Written. Written. Yael, woman of the tent. You're spot on. Looking for a wife. She's good with rip sure. The answer is. He was on the last step of the ladder when he jumped. Think about that. A hundred foot ladder, and he was on the last step when he jumped. That's how he that's how he, he, he didn't harm himself. There is a lot of instruction in that if you will understand. The wise will understand that. Remember I talked about the pursuit of justice and perverted justice? Those that pursue justice and then those that, you know, have this <laughs> poltergeist. Uh, uh, understanding uh, opposed to pursuit. You're thinking this poltergeist moment. Reality. Reality staring you in the face here. You must learn to think realistically. Why? It's because we've been conditioned in these religions that we were in to think unrealistically, right? And I, and I, and I, and I group Judaism right in there. Think realistically. I mean, my, my goodness, a man was halfway down the ladder, or just about off the ladder, and then he jumped off. That's how he didn't harm himself. The same way it is with your Torah. You walk this Torah. You get to a point to where you can jump, then you jump. But you take yourself down the ladder. You don't jump from the, the top of the ladder. That's not wise. That's not using wisdom. We must be wise. We must use wisdom. Wisdom must be our friend. Needs to be our friend. Must have it. Uh, here's another one for you. What is a question you can never answer yes or no? What? No, here it is. What is a question you can never answer yes to? What is a question that you can never answer yes to? What is a question, and we all like to ask questions, what is a question that you can never answer yes to? Any takers on that one? Think for a minute. This is a thinking game. Yeah, Hill Warren just says the one that was never asked. Anybody else? What is the question that you could never answer yes to? I'll give you a minute, because I know some of you are thinking. You're putting on those thinking caps, and you're... you're you're, you're making that brain work for you today. What is a question that you could never answer yes to? I'll give you the answer. Are you asleep? 
You see, if you're asleep, if you're sleeping, you can never answer answer yes to that question because you're sleeping. Yeah, I know some of you are some, uh, you know, so, so some of you talk in your sleep. Maybe yes, I come across there sometimes. Cause I, I was in the military, basic training. My goodness, I never realized how many people talk in their sleep. People talk in their sleep. What is the question you can never, never answer yes to? When somebody asks you, are you asleep? And you're sleeping, you can't answer yes to that because you're sleeping, right? All right, last one right here, which does have some context and relevance. To the Creator and the belief systems out there about the Creator and how the Creator wants us to really serve Him. I think this is important. What can pass before the sun and cast no shadow? Think about this one. What can pass before the sun and cast no shadow? This is an interesting one. For those of you who see the sun a lot, uh, uh, Toro Walker says air. Close, Toro Walker. We play it hot and cold. You warm. You warm. Air. That's, that's, that's good. Okay. Wind. Wind. There you go. Wind. Hey, Halakova. I hope I'm not I'm messing up your name. It's, the answer is wind. What can pass before the sun but cast no shadow? Wind can. Wind can do this. It does it all the time. It is invisible. It can be felt. And there's a force of nature. Wind. Wind can. Now, just like the son of Aaron was giving you his 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 his, his uh, little joke with the you know the different ministers and their perspectives. Well, what I've seen with the ministers here in San Antonio, Texas, the ones that I was, I was associated with when in Haiti, what you get, you know, the what you get is a lot of wind. You get a lot of wind. Wind has no shadow to it. So you you just you you get a lot of hot air, which is wind, in my opinion. Same way you get in Judaism. You get a lot of hot air. But I want to pursue justice that can cast a shadow. See, I want something concrete, something physical. I don't want wind. I mean, if you're tired of hot air, hot air is not going to benefit you when it comes to rescue. But something physical will. Something you can touch, you can feel reality. Not no hot wind. I don't need hot wind. I don't need poltergeist moments. I mean, I'm too busy in pursuit mode. You see? I'm too busy trying to pursue. I, I don't need no more hot air. Any of you trying to buy a car, want to buy a car, don't listen to all that hype. You tell them to give you a car fax. Don't, oh, well, this car do this, that, the other. Especially if you're buying cars. Uh, here around Texas where they have all these little floods. They're trying to sell you these flooded cars. Right by the car and will tell you, take that car in, especially if it's new or used. And make sure it wasn't in, you know, one of these flooded cars that they're trying to get rid of. They're trying to get this inventory of flooded cars sold. So they'll give you all this hot air. Oh, it has this bells and whistles and this, that. Do like that commercial say, get the car facts. Give me the car facts on this car. I want the facts. Oh, don't give me all your little truths. Oh, you you hit this button and the car will do this. You do this button and I know I know don't I don't push my buttons. <laughs> I, I don't need to push my button. I want the car facts. This is the way you need to be. You should be sick and tired of the hot air, the wind. Yet now, when you're in the Torah. You're not receiving the wind. Some of you are, you're not recipients of the wind. Some of you are delving out wind. And when your, when, when, when your wind, your hot air goes before the sun, who is the sun that I mean? It could be the son of Aaron. It could be the son of the most highest. It could be the sun itself. The, uh, the, the, oh my goodness. When it goes before the sun, what happens? It casts no shadow. It reminds me of what the Rabbi Yeshua Master Jesus of Nazareth, what did he say? He said, depart from me. I never knew you. Why? It's because you never left a shadow. You were just wind. <laughs> you don't want to be wind, Mishpaha, claiming to be in Torah. You see, you're just giving the wind of the Torah. You're just giving hot air. 
but there's nothing physical to you to cast a shadow when you pass before the sun. So you go before the sun, and the sun don't even recognize you. Do you see where we go in here? You think about this. As you claim to be under the Torah, as some of you have even taken the vow, you've taken the oath. Reba Benil says, just like somebody told me this week, they paid for something. I said, where's the receipt? No, uh, no proof, so no money was given. Oh, indeed. As many today may be saying, oh, I paid the price to get in the kingdom of the most highest. Well, how did you pay the price? Think about it. Well, you who live in Oklahoma, what is your saying in Oklahoma? In Oklahoma, to show me, say, well, show me. Show me that you paid the price. Our Son of Aaron was talking about this in his lecture. Let your deeds go before you. We don't need no more hot air. When hot air passes before the sun, it don't, it, it don't cast a shadow. So the sun don't even recognize you, you see. Oh, uh, well, yeah, correct me if I'm wrong with the sun. What does the sunshine state? Somebody Google that real quick. I mean, the state that says, uh, uh, show me state. Is it Missouri, the show me state? I know we have a state that says, uh, that, that, that their, their slogan is, is, okay, Missouri is the sun. Show me state. Well, show me. You say in the Torah? Well, show me. Don't tell me you in the Torah. It's important that we understand that. Let, now I want to go to the Torah for a minute because all of this, all of this hinges on relationship. And even Torah in our hidden truth we break scrolls. If you don't have them, make sure you get these scrolls that were transliterated from the from the Hebrew by a son of Aaron. So very important. You add these to your library. So very important. I want to take you back to Bereshit. This awesome story. This awesome history. Bereshit, Genesis chapter 18. We know the story. We know our history. We got Sarah. She's been told she's going to have a baby. She's back there laughing. But after that, look at verse 16. You know, we, we set the stage. You know, Abraham is, is, is having the Passover. With Jesus. Master Yeshua. They're having Passover together. My goodness. Verse 16. After Passover... Look at this. You see, this is the beauty of our, our history, is it just repeats itself. Passover is true justice. True justice. And remember I talked about early, earlier, justice and judgment are a what? They're a match made in the heavens. This is so true. I want you to see this. You see, when, you, when you're in, in, in complete compliance or you're... you're, you're you're, you're, you're trying to complete your incompleteness because you're doing that by what? By your walk, by your, your walking it out because the work is done, now it's time for you to walk. You walk so you can complete your incompleteness. So you see, doing the, the Passover, our annual festivals, this is how you complete yourself. You 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 incomplete your incompleteness. But you you just keep on doing these 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 things that you're supposed to do. These statutes, these judgments, these laws, these ordinances, these commandments in the kingdom of the Most Highest. Pursue, baby. This is pursuit. So then, after this time, the men get up. Then it says, then Genesis chapter eighteen, verse sixteen. Then the men rose from there and gazed toward Sedom. And Abraham went with them to send them on their way. Look at verse 17. And Yahweh said, Shall I hide from Abraham what I am doing? Verse 18. Since Abraham surely shall become a great and mighty nation, and all the nations of the earth shall be grafted into him. Wow. Now, Yahweh is not a liar. The master... Jesus, the master Yeshua, he don't lie, right? Now, if we're told that all the nations shall be grafted into Abraham, pray tell, why are we running around here hating on, on people? 
Everybody's grafted in Abraham. You say you're Abraham, but you hate you, you Joe Blow next to you. You disrespect, you know, your wife who's grafted in Abraham as well. All the nations are grafted in Abraham. So why do you have problems just discriminating against a nation? You shouldn't. Discrimination, my goodness. Discrimination belongs, discrimination is hog water. That's what it is. It's pig water. We don't need to drink from that cup. So if it's based on color, discrimination based on how slanted your eyes are, discrimination based on how straight your hair, it doesn't matter. Discrimination based on your social economic status, discrimination based on your, 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 your job preference. I remember at one time here in San Antonio, women didn't like trash men. Women, if you said you was a trash man, that was like the turn off magnet, not the turn on magnet. I remember that time. Because back in the day, I used to use that. Because, you know, some women, they get so naggy. You know, you're hanging out, and women come up to you, say, what do you do? You, you, can, you can smell them a mile away. Oh, hi, hey, my name's so-so. What do you do? What do you do for a living? What are you doing? I used to tell them I'm a trash man, and they would run away from me like cockroaches when you turn the lights on. Oh, yeah, I'm a trash man, baby. I pick up your trash on Tuesday and Thursday. Oh, man, they would just, oh, my goodness, they would just, you know, oh, man, they wouldn't talk to me anymore. That was good. Because I, 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 I'm trying to get rid of these types. But now, my goodness, these days, trash men are making money. You tell somebody you're a trash man, yeah, oh, yeah, they, they cling it to you now. Because trash men make money. So now these days, you know, women are clued up. They're not just judging a man by, by you know, your occupation. Now they realize, oh, trash men, they, they must have got the memo is that trash men are making uh, uh, making good money, so now they put them on the good list. So you trash men, they'll still hang around you and have a conversation with So now, you know, you must, for those of you who are still single, you must think of another type of occupation. Maybe those sewage men, you know those ones that you know clean out the porta potties. Maybe that's maybe that's another good one to add to the list to shoo away the unwanted woman that has an agenda not not to not to be loyal to you, but just wants to you know suck your wallet dry. I call them the vampire women. They just love to just you know they suck suck at your wallet. Oh my goodness, you yaya woman or teen, you can't say fast food because fast food is making money these days. Because minimum wage is going up in a lot of states. Minimum wage in some states is $15 an hour. In some states, can you believe that? $15 an hour to drop some chicken and flip a burger? I, I call him says, the piece of delivery guy. <laughs> yeah. No, you get down there now. Yeah, you, you get down there now. I, I, I can't talk with a piece of delivery guy because I think they, they get paid just on tips. And their wages are very low. But some of these states, my goodness. Minimum wage is $15 an hour. My goodness. To flip a burger? $15 an hour? That's good money. That's good money. Although, you have to weigh it out with what? With the cost of living in your area as well. So some of these wages are just coming up with the cost of living. Cost of living may be high in some of these areas. You have to weigh that out as well. Cause, because living in California is not the same as cost of living in Texas. My goodness, it's night and day. It's night and day. So these things need to be weighed out as well. So yeah, back to where we were going here. Back to where we were heading. So so we, 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 we see judgment and justice are hand in hand. You see, so we look at Genesis, we read Genesis, we, we're with the story here in our history. So when Sedom is going to get judgment, put pour down on Sedom. And we look at Genesis 18 and 18 where it says, Well, Yahweh is speaking, the Master Yahweh is speaking, he says, Since Abraham surely shall become a great and mighty nation, and all the nations of the earth shall be grafted into him. My goodness, all the nations of the earth shall be grafted into Abraham.
and you should, you as the people of the books, you should have no hatred towards no man, no woman. The son of Aaron told you in his lecture, what? You to love, you to love all. Love the pastor and the priest. Love them all. Love them all, Mishpaha. You, you, you have no room for discrimination, for hate, for none of this, none of this drama out here. You're supposed to be the polar opposite. And if you have difficulties in this area, always go back to Genesis 18 and 18. As these people will be grafted, they're all grafted in in some kind of way. Why? It's because Israel, Israel is mixed into all of these nations. Oh, James is clearing that up. James is saying, and they get paid, the, the piece of delivery guys get paid uh, by the hour and tips for the piece of delivery. I used to be one. Wow. So you get hourly pay and tips. Well, that's good. I'll ask this time Pizza Hut comes to the house. I'll ask them. See, we'll see, see what the deal is here in, in, in Texas, in San Antonio. Can't say Uber. Uber drivers do pretty well. A lot of people doing Uber and Lyft. I, I know in Vegas, they, they're telling me they're doing real well. In Vegas, a lot of people go through Vegas. It's like, you know, San Antonio is a tourist town as well. So tourist town, Uber, Lyft, they do pretty well as well. But you mean you need to institute some of these methods in your testing mode, in your testing module, as you're seeking that, 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 that loyal wife, is you, you, you must institute some of these methods. Don't tell them what you really do. Tell them what they don't want to hear and see if they stay with you. That's the test right there. You see, because just like Israel had two personalities, you too need to have two personalities, maybe three and four, in these nations. Sometimes you need to be Israel, sometimes you need to be Jacob. <laughs> yeah, you need to have that. You need to harness and use it the right way, though. It can be used to benefit you. To be a blessing to you, not a curse. And to draw those who are supposed to be with you and to keep those that are supposed to be away from you. You see? You need to use that. You need to use that. We must be wise and cunning. We, we have to be. Otherwise, we'll get run over. I'm talking to you from experience. Because, you know, and I'm not, I'm not woman bashing, because it goes the other way too. Men and women will come to you with their wiles, and you'll fall for that. you love that big butt and a smile, and you'll fall for that. And you don't realize the rest of the song. Biff, Biff DeVoe said that that's poison. <laughs> you forget that part, because you love the big butt and the smile. Don't fall for that. You look for the loyalty. You you test them. See if they're money hungry. Or if they're truly concerned and care about you. Wow. That's, that's what you need to do. I was watching this old gangster movie. I like those old gangster movies. And I forgot which one it was. It wasn't The Godfather. But it was one of the other ones. And he, and he said, well, you have to put the girls to the test. They're teenagers. Like, okay. Well, how do I know if she's the one? And one of the guys, little boys, he said, Well, you'll know that she's the one because when you open the door and let her in your car, if she goes and unlocks your car door, I forgot what movie was, if, if she goes and, and, and unlocks your side, then you know she's the one. He was like, wow. And sure enough, he ran into this girl. And he liked this girl. Guess what? He was Italian, and this girl was black, and he loved this girl, and this little girl. So he went, he would go walk her from the black side of school just doing segregation. And he finally got the courage, to, well, she asked him on a date. She like, let's go out sometime. He was like, yeah, cool. They had a lot in common. He goes and picks her up, and she passed that test. He puts her, he opens the door for her, and, and, and she passed the test. I can't remember the name of that movie, but I'll tell you, it's a good, a good little movie, good gangster movie. And sure enough, and he's walking around the back and he's watching to see if she's going to unlock his door for him. And sure enough, that little black girl 
unlocks the door. She unlocks the door for him. And he's like, yeah, he's happy because she passed the test. She passed the test. So you got to, men, you got to start giving these women tests. You listening via YouTube, you listening live here in this forum. You got you to gotta start giving them the tests. You got to become trash man personality, pizza hut man personality. You, I mean, you may be making six figures, five figures, so what? Sometimes you have to become the delivery boy. Yeah, a pizza delivery boy. You tell these women this and to see what they're going to do. If they're going to struggle with you or if they're running away like a sprinter. 50 yard dash, 100 yard meter dash sprinter. They're running away from you that fast. Or if they're going to sit there and they're going to struggle with you. That's important. There you go. It's the Bronx Tale. That's the name of that movie. These things must be done. I like those old gangster movies. You learn a lot from them. Because you must do these things. Women the same way. The man say he's going to give you everything under the moon. He promised you everything under the Honey, I'll laugh so that star for you and I'll give it to you. Well, just tell him to go get you a cell phone. Oh, my goodness, crickets in the room. Baby, I need a new cell phone so we can talk. Oh, baby, you know my money funny. They start doing that tap dance. My goodness. They start tap dancing around all that. But they told you with their mouth, oh, baby, I'm going to give you uh, a, 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 a nice house. You'll get clothing, shelter. You'll have food on the table. All you're asking for is a cell phone so you can continue your, your relationship. The one says, I don't ask anymore. I get it myself. Well, that's sad. And I'm, and I'm sorry that you have to do that to board off, but that's sad. Because, it's, it, and again, I was telling this to my wife, and she understands is that, my goodness, to find a good man in today's time is very hard. It's very hard to do. And it's just as hard to find a good woman. It's very hard. But just because it's hard, that don't mean you don't, you don't accomplish your mission. You still must walk to find that good woman, that good man. You may have to walk many miles. You may have to get on planes, trains, and automobiles. So be it. And I'm talking to you from experience. Sometimes you have to do that. But when you get it, my goodness, it's heaven on earth. And she passed the test. My goodness. And she passes the test. Wow. That's, that's awesome. I'm in the bathroom the other day, taking a shower, and my wife passed the test. I used to always say, man, you know, you take a shower alone, and what's the spot that you always want somebody to get? I don't know if you think about this, but I do. I like my back scrub. How many of you know what I'm talking about? You get in the shower, and you want somebody to, you know, man, your, your arm just don't reach back there unless you practice a lot of yoga, and you can bend and you can get your back real good. And you know what I used to always tell myself? I'm speaking to myself because I do that a lot. I say, keep up. You know, I just, man, I just can't wait till I get a wife that can just rub my back. My wife comes in and passes the test the other day. And I'm jumping up and down in the shower. I'm like, she passed the test. I didn't tell her anything. She comes in. She says, honey, you're, you're back. Let me do your back. Boy, she starts scrubbing my back. And I'm thinking, she passed the test. Ruka Shim Master Jesus. I didn't even ask her to do it. She passed the test. This is the one. And I'm thinking, about oh, this is the one. And you only need one for you listening via YouTube, thinking you need 20,000 of them. You only need one to pass the test. Just one. Hakoheen is saying, amazing. Not many women here would even think of this. Hakoheen, son of Aaron, you're absolutely right. And I have you to thank for it. Now, I had to do the walking. The son of Aaron told me, hey, you got to go to China, get your wife. Well, I'm getting all kind of backlash from some people. Why would Rabbi Kiva go away to China to get a wife? Well, what business is that of yours? Because the wife passed the test in China. 
You ever? And my question to that person would be: You ever had a wife, a woman, for that matter? You don't even ask her to do this. She's scrubbing your back in the shower. How about that? That's the question that I have. Wow, amazing, isn't it? She passed the test. I didn't even tell her. But this, uh, this was my thinking for years, man. I, I just only had a wife, and I've been through a couple of divorces and for her. Never had. It's not. It's not like I haven't been in relationships. It's not. It's not like I haven't been walking. But I never had a wife pass the test. And I told this to Akoi the other day. He'll tell you. I told this the other day. This is the this is the first righteous wife I've ever had in my whole life. And I'm in my forties. This is my first righteous wife I've had in my whole life. I've never had a righteous wife before. Think about that. Is it? Listen to what I just said, because this may not be permeating. This may not be marinating. This is the first righteous wife I've had in my whole life. Righteous woman I've had in my whole life. Wow. You men... You probably would understand this a lot more than women. Because you're a man. You think about that. This is the first loyal wife I've had my whole life. My whole life. That's heavy, isn't it? I thought about that. I was like, wow. Ruka Shem, this is a mer- this heaven on earth. And I, my wish is for all of you listening via YouTube, all you men, to experience that same feeling. I want all of you to experience the same way of life. You should. You, but again, it's going to require you walking. I firmly believe the Master has a complete woman for all of you. The work is complete in a woman for all of you men. You just got to go walk and get her. That's what I did. Ready made. She's already ready made. I just had to go walk and get her. And now... I'm getting back scrubs off cue. Not on cue, because I didn't tell her to do it. I didn't tell her to do it. Think about that. So, if, you know, passing that test, relationship. This is what it's all about as we go back to our, our verses in, in Bereshit. In Genesis chapter 18. Now, let me read. Genesis 18, 18 again. We're going to set the stage here because this is the master Yahweh speaking. And Yahweh said in verse 17, so in verse 18, Yahweh still saying, since Abraham surely shall become a great and mighty nation. Well, where's cursed in here if you proclaim to be, you know, a son of Abraham? There's no, no curse in there nowhere. Great and mighty nation. I, can't, I cannot glean curse out of any of that. And all the nations of the earth shall be grafted into him. Look at verse 19. For I have a relationship with him. Bam! Wow! Ooh, we. The Master Yahweh said, I have a relationship with Abraham. So for you women, don't run around here saying you have a relationship with God. The relationship is with the man that you attach yourself with. He will connect you to God. Do you see that, women? My sister, I tell you, she's still, well, she's finally coming out of that. For a minute there, she had a relationship with the master. Oh, I, I don't need to marry because I have a relationship. I'm married to Jesus. Oh, yeah, that, that didn't last too long. Before she realized, man, I, I need to be married to a physical man. That when he passes by the sun, he leaves a shadow. I don't, I don't need to be married to some hot air and wind. And I'm not saying that the master's hot air and wind. But this is this hot air, uh, 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 uh theology that my sister had for a minute. Then she came back down to earth. Rupa Shem thanked Jesus for that. And she came back down to earth. And Jesus said, look, I can't be married to you, Angela. That's my sister's name. I can't be married to you, Angela. You've got to go get a man. I'm so glad she got that revelation. Now she's got a boyfriend. They're happy. I'm happy for her. A relationship. I have a relationship with him. 
Do you see? You want to start talking about justice? Judgment? Everything hinges on us with relationships, man. Everything hinges on relationships. So we must get our relationships right as the master Yahweh has a relationship with Abraham. That's telling us a lot about what we need to be doing down here parallel. It should be about relationships and how we build them and how we form them and how we make them. Some relationships are going to be closer than others. So be it. But we need to be that relationship magnet that's going to draw people to us, not away from us. And we can't do that discriminating. I'm so glad I had my, my quiet time to myself. Because now I, I have a high, I've learned a lot about myself. And now I can teach my daughter and bring her up in such a beautiful way. To where, yeah, a lot of these things she agreeing to, but that's okay. Because now she's going to be taught the right way on how to deal with discrimination and hatred. Because people are going to do that. But you have to just learn, learn to ignore these kind of people and go on and carry on and having the great characteristics, the great character traits that you have instilled within you to make this world a better place. Not to join the hate club. Not to join the haterade club. No, you don't have to join them. Because what they want you to do and your profile to do is give it right back. If they give it to you, you give it to them right back. You don't have to do that. Our God will measure that out. You don't have to measure it out. He don't need your help. I'm reading Isaiah 59. My goodness. So Isaiah 59 starts out by saying, and God, the God of Israel, the Master Yahweh, His hand is not shortened. You don't, you don't, you, His hand is not short. You don't have to, His hand is not short. Neither is His mercies. But a lot of times we shorten ourselves. Thus, we limit ourselves by how we are the measure that, yeah, just so I lecture was spot on. Self-limit, limiting. Limitation is not coming from heavens because heavens is limited, unlimited. But we limit. We do the limiting. So back to the relationship factor. Genesis 18 and 19. Why well, have a relationship with him in order that he may command his children. Listen to this. That he may command his children and his household after him. That they may guard the halaha of Yahweh, the way of Yahweh. To do the zedaka, to do the zedika, and justice. Wow! That Yahweh may bring Abraham, that may bring to Abraham what he has spoken to him. That he may guard the halaha of Yahweh and do what? And do what? And do justice. May do zedika. The righteous ways, the right ways, and, oh, get this, by the way, from Newsflash, for some of you. This son of Aaron that you do know of, that's in Pensacola, Florida, right now, physical man, that if he walks by the sun, believe me, it will leave a shadow. <laughs> he is known. He is known of the sun. He lives in the sunshine state. And, by the way, can anybody tell me uh, his lineage? Uh, what house is this, you know, son of Aaron from? Can anybody tell me, by the way? Can anybody tell me? Wow. There you go, J.B. Israel. Some more confirmation for those of you who still struggle. Some more confirmation for you. Straight out of our Torah. Confirmation. He will do zadaka and justice. So, so that Yahweh may bring to Abraham what he has spoken to him. My goodness. Back to Bereshit, back to the beginnings. We must look at these verses, Mishpahah. Look at them and then examine them. 
Because underneath the sheets, they're telling us many things that we can reveal. Many things can be revealed to us. Revealed, thus revelation can be dealt out to us when we're ready to receive it. And when we can receive it. To do zedaka And justice. So, when I asked the question earlier to the early person, like, where do you go to, how do you do justice? How do you do it? We're told to pursue justice. I firmly believe Torah is justice. But then how do I do Torah? How do I how do I do it? Who who I mean do I what do I what do I do? How do I do justice? Is it my will to pursue justice? You see, because just go back to the verse, we're told that not you will do justice, but you will justice, justice. You will pursue. Maybe it's not your will to really pursue justice. Thus, you become perverted justice. But what you're seeking is like a perversion of what justice really is. Because if you really want to pursue justice, you see. Yes, yeah, Paul Walker, I would encourage all of you to go look at that like Isaiah 59. Yes, Yahweh. It puts it all out there for you. You see, because what needs to be corrected is that we need to go back and, and fix what our forefathers did wrong. That requires us keeping the statutes, judgments, ordinances, commandments right. Not thinking in our own sight, oh, we're going to do it this way and pervert justice, but we need to do the pursuit of justice. And that's going through who? That's going through the sons of Aaron. The tribe of Zatu. My goodness! You can't dream this stuff up. You can't dream it up. Hollywood cannot <laughs> cannot write a better script than this right here. Facts on the ground. Justice, justice. This is what we must pursue. We must pursue it. But do you have the will to pursue justice? This was this this was keeps some folks. Uh, attached to African uh, forever Israel and some folks that just 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 go by the wayside you see this what does that this is exactly what does it it's that folks don't have the wheel power you don't have the will. Why? It's because you have the ability to choose. And this is why we, we must respect and love all the humanity. All those that, you know, in some way, shape, form, or fashion may be, may be what grafted into Abraham. Is we must expect, respect their ability to be able to choose. To be able to say, no, excuse me, this Torah is not for me, or no. I respectfully disagree with you. I don't see Torah that way. I see Torah as a dispensation, and we're the new dispensations. Excuse me. So that Torah is old. I don't need to do that Torah. So you respect them and their demented God. You respect them, and you, you still go on, and you carry on with your walk, because your walk is incomplete. The work is complete, but your walk is incomplete. So you're you're continually walking to do what? To 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 complete the work that's already completed because that work needs to be completed in you. It needs to be in you. So I see why if Hokma gave me that word this morning. The statement. The work is completed, but the walk is incomplete. How do we get a complete walk? Well, we must go back to the complete way, you see? And the complete way is us going through what? Through what we already have established. Through the patterns that we see from the very beginnings. These patterns. Even, even Mishpaha, even when we look, we, 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 we talk about the justice and the judgments. I would encourage you all to take a look at this because it will blow you away. How just, justice and judgment are coupled together. Like two kissing cousins. Like a match made in heaven, which it is.
And I asked you earlier, and I'm going to the Proverbs for this, Ms. Yell, but I asked you earlier about uh, how do you do justice? How do you do it? And I looked at Proverbs, uh, Proverbs 21 and 3. And it says this, To do justice and judgment is more acceptable to Yahweh than sacrifice. But then it gets even deeper, Ms. Bahar, for those of you who are listening via YouTube. But the great commentary that we get in the Hid Trophy Break Scrolls really gets down to the meat and potatoes of the whole matter. And there it says this in the commentary uh, written there by the son of Aaron, I call him Rabbi Simon Alton, it says this, Judgment and justice of individuals is what, should, is what we should strive for to show kindness and mercy to all people. Wow! It's to show kindness and mercy to all people. Again, relationship. Remember, Master Yahweh says, said that in Genesis 18, I have a relationship with Abraham. I have a relationship with him. Now, what do we know about Abraham and his relationship with other folks? Anybody tell me, what do we know about Abraham and his relationship? Last time I checked, Abraham always had his doors open for everybody. Boy, we can sure learn. And what I'm talking about, when you say, well, Rabbi Keeper said, leave our, our house doors open at all times. So when all your stuff gets stolen, you can blame it on Rabbi Kiefer. I'm not saying that. But I'm saying you need to have an open door policy in eight, in 2018 for all people. All people. I don't care how they come to you looking like. I don't care how they come to you looking like straight hair, curly hair, no hair, bald head, tattoos, no tattoos, uh, ear piercings, no ear piercings. For some of these, these people, you may be the only Abraham they ever see, the only Moses they ever see, the only Torah they ever see, the only witness to the creator of the heavens and the universe that they may ever see. And y'all forbid that you turn them away because of what kind of clothes they have on, because of how they smell, because of what kind of shoes they wear. You must come out of this conditioning. And I tell you, it was so instructional to hear people from another country brought up in another different culture come over here and within a year's time, they give a report on America. And you know what the words of that boy was? It was this. They discriminate against me. What a report. The first report my daughter hears from one of her Chinese compatriots is, oh, they discriminate against me. There's a lot of discrimination here. Wow. Why? Is because he's different? Because he don't speak your language the way you speak it? Because his eyes are slanted? Because his hair is straight? Because he's yellow and you're white? Because he's yellow and you're black? What is it? Maybe because he's smarter than you and you're dumb? And you want to dumb him down so he can be like you? There's so much haterade out there that people drink. And haterade comes in many colors, just like Gatorade and Kool-Aid come in many colors, many flavors. Right? Last time I checked. Wow, what, what, a, what, a, what a testimony. What a report. And you know, the son of Aaron came here to do the same thing, to get a report. And believe me, <laughs> the son of Aaron can write a book on the report here in North America and the, and, the, and the nature of the people here and how they act and their mannerisms. He can write a book, I'm telling you. <laughs> but those things were for the son of Aaron to go through. He had to go through those things. He had to come here and do these things. He had to come here and experience these things. How long he'll stay? I don't know. I don't know. But he's here now in North America. The son of Aaron is here. The, the, the Kohanim. Israel is here. So 
this is what we have to look at. This is what we have to examine going forward. That justice, justice. I mean, that stuff hit me hard. I was like, wow, what is this? How do I do justice? Back to our question. You see, because today what we find, and I'm not dealing with the Gentiles, per se, but uh, more so with those that say they're in the confines of Torah. Their Torah is, is it justice they pursuing? Is it justice pursuit? Or perverted justice? Pursuit or perversion? You see? But again, for us, the justice must start in our home. Now, if you can say you have justice in your home, if you can say that you have justice in your home, how do you base, what do you base that upon? Because maybe it's two stories. I ask you if you have justice as the husband, then I ask your wife if there's justice in the home. Maybe your wife said, there's no justice in this home. Yeah, you're screaming, oh yeah, this is, this is the most just home you're going to go to, Rabbi. What is that justice based on? I mean, who, who, what's the template? Who sets the standard for justice? You see, this is the questions that we have to get down to. You know, Torah tells us to put, you know, judges in place, to put officers in place. Yet, what standard do we do that by? As we see here on YouTube, there's a lot of people that are saying that they're judges. But based on whose standard? I mean, who made you a judge? Who made you a teacher? Who made you an officer? Who has the authority to do these things, you see? Everybody claims to be a judge on YouTube. Judge and jury. Justice is so skewed today. True, factual justice is, 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 is pure. But justice, this not justice, justice, but justice on, it, on, on, on its face value today in these nations is so skewed. You get all kind of forms of it. You don't know whether you're coming or you're going. You don't know whether what to believe or what not to believe. Because there's so much of it out there. Everybody's saying that they have it right, right? So where do you go to? Who is the go-to God? This is the question that you, this is the question everybody should be asking. Yeah, things can branch off from the go-to guy. But where do you go to? Where, where, where's the source? Well, I just go to God, Rabbi. Well, God, how's God going to give you justice? Well, yeah, you remember those old drive-in? We still have one here. Old drive-in movies. I don't know if y'all have them so much more so in the UK. But you go to these drive-in movies where you drive your car up and you put that box on your window so you can watch the movie. Uh, how, how many of you remember that? Any of you remember that? Where you go through those drive throughs and you put that box on your... Man, that's really... That's, that's, that's like old school there. That's the style of it. You put that box on your window. You roll down your window a little bit for that box so you can hear, get the intercom, and you can watch this movie on this big old outdoors screen. Anybody remember that besides me? Some people think they have that box. That they have that box, they put it in their window, and they put it in their house, and God, the God of Israel, will speak to them from that box. And the God of Israel is not speaking to them from that box. They're not. It's not speaking to them. It, it, there, there's nothing coming out. It's like audio, audio problems. There's uh, technical difficulties. There's no audio. Yeah, it's because God is not going to speak to you like that. That's not going to happen. You leave that box in your window as long as you want. It's not happening that way. And yet, God, of, the God of Israel has been speaking to you for the longest through His priesthood, through that son of Aaron that came to the shores of North America. He forsook all that he had came over here just for you. He left all that he had over there came over here just for you. Yet you say you still wait to hear from God. And I'm thinking, man, the God of Israel is shaking his head. The Master Yahweh is shaking his head like, what the heck? What else do I have to do? Bring the man into your house 
and yet the son of Aaron has been into some of your homes. If the son of Aaron has been into your house, please put up a, a capital A. He literally been to your house. Now, what else do you do after that? I just don't know. What, what else has to happen? I better put up my capital A a couple of times over. So, what else What else have to happen after that? I mean, what, what else needs to be done? I don't know, Mr. Bob. You have to help me, help you. And yet, heaven is saying, no, you have to help yourself. Because your, your, your walk is incomplete. The work is complete. But your walk is incomplete. Jim, I'm saying, I remember that little black box. <laughs> In, in, the, in, in the car window at the drive-in theater. After all, the spark of life is, is, is in every, every, every being on earth. Life, love and kindness with you, 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 human dignity. All the two commandments right. Shalom, shalom to all. La la tov. I have a good week. You too, Simha. Have a great week over there. I think you're still in California. In California. Have a great week ahead. So, yeah, these are the, this is an important point that you have to ask yourself. If we're told by the Torah to pursue justice, how many of you right now can say you have pursued justice? How many of you can say you have found justice? Put up a capital F if you have found justice. You pursued justice and you found it. You, 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 got, it, you got justice incarcerated. You got it hood when you got it, you know, attached to your arm. How many of you have done that? You said, okay, I, I have pursued justice. How many of you are still in pursuit of justice? How many of you can give a flying fruit about justice? <laughs> I mean, I know you. it's getting that time. It's 12 o'clock. Yeah, I know. I know. I get it. But I think it's so important that you do understand this, Mishpaha, is that everything goes to the sons of Aaron. I'm a product of the, son of, uh, of the sons of Aaron. Uh, he's, he's my teacher for life. Rabbi Simon, I really, for life, and, and even after, into the next life. He's my teacher. Forever. Maybe we'll have houses next to each other in the next life. Have barbecues together. We can, we can exchange uh, recipes or whatever. Uh, barbecue sauce recipes or something like that. But it's important for you to understand is that for if you're Israel... You know, we, 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 we must connect to the sons of Aaron, and then we must listen and follow through with the instructions that's given to us, because that's as closest to God, his voice that you're going to hear, for the majority of you. That's, uh, listening via YouTube, if you're still waiting to hear from God, my goodness, you've heard from him in this lecture today, through his voice, through his mouthpiece, you see. But now, there's a next step. Once you corral justice, you lasso justice in, you, you, you pursue justice, and you corner justice in the corner, then what do you do with justice? You sit there and eat tea and crumpets, what do you do with each other? What do you do? What do you, you sit there and play dominoes together with justice, what do, you, what do you do? You sit there and you go to a movie together with justice, what do you do? How do you do justice once you get justice? That's the big, that's, that's, that's the... You know, million dollar question. After you pursue justice, you must begin to what? You must begin to 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 walk justice. But you have to have the proper instruction of justice given to you, because there's a, a, a skewed justice out there today. That's just like my goodness. Everybody saying they're doing what's right in the sight of God. Whatever, man. Not when you beat your wife. Not when you're disrespecting, you know, your parents. Not when you you, 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 you you can't get on with humanity. You can't show love and mercy. Wow. You know, I read that verse there in Proverbs. Proverbs 21 and 3. To do justice and judgment is more accept acceptable to your own point of sacrifice. I thought about the situation that I had here in San Antonio with the... With the, the so-called Jews here, and here I am seeking, uh, seeking the facts, and I go to the synagogue. And, you know, they're doing all the sacrifices. They're doing everything according to Torah and their understanding they're supposed to do. But yet I come to them, and then they show me the trash can. And I'm like, wow. To do justice and judgment is more acceptable to Yahweh than sacrifice. Mm, wow. Wow, so all that, the laws of Moses that they have in the synagogue means nothing when they turn me away. 
when they rejected me, when I didn't belong, when this wasn't for me, and they told me, you know, they, they were judge and jury. They told me, oh, this is not for you. You're in the wrong place. Yet at the same time, there was something actually deeper than that to that. Oh, indeed, the Lord. Yes, I understand that. But to be turned away from the Torah, the very Torah that they say they cling to. The Torah that say this for all, because Abraham would be grafted into all nations. Well, not according to the Eskenazi. No, I'm, I'm, not, I'm, I'm, I'm turned away. Torah to them is a boys club. Only certain people can get in. That's it. The rest you stay out. You stay away. You see? So this is what we have to look at and examine going forward. You know, again, and you, 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 you know you make a good point. Is that there's blessings. There's blessings. There's blessings even at your lowest point. There is a blessing behind it. You see? Think about it. Even when you think there's rejection, there's acceptance. But you must see that. Some of you only see one side. But it's balance. You know, it, 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 there's a balance to life. And when you find that balance, you found heaven on earth. You literally found heaven on earth when you get that balance. Some of you are too much one way. You need to get that balance. And that's what we need to work. So, because, because why? Because why? Our walk is incomplete. We're, we're, we're steadily trying to complete our walk. So when we get that report card... You know, we stand before the creator of the heavens and universe. Sis, our report card is complete. It's acceptable. That's what I want more than anything in this world. Is to be found pleasing in the sight of the master. To be found worthy. And to be recognized. To be known and not unknown. Remember what the master Yeshua said? He said, depart from me. I never knew you. Wow. Is that heavy? Don't let that weight be upon you. I never knew you. You were wind to me. You passed by the sun and you didn't cast a shadow. So I didn't even see you. You were just wind. Hot air. Think about that going forward. So on, on that note, I think I'll wrap it up for today myself. And uh, remember your to-do list. We talked about earlier Mishpaha. And remember, you know, you know, justice pursuit or perverted justice? <laughs> That's the question. Bring that justice in your home first. Get it right in your home, and it'll, it'll permeate out outside of your home. Okay, on that note, we'll wrap it up. We'll leave it up for any questions. I'm going to turn it back over to our Kohen. And if you want to give testimonies, please feel free to do so. Text them in on this Shabbat day. Give thanks to the creator of the heavens and the universes for our opportunity for us to come together and make improvement on ourselves in our walk, how we walk, because the work is complete. We, we just we we just must walk and we our walk is incomplete. Let's 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 get our walk right. And we're gonna you know until we take our last breath, Mr. Baha, we're gonna be working on our walk, right? Believe me, we are. If you're not then you know <laughs> something's wrong. You should always be, you know, working to improve your walk. Working to improve. Don't, don't, don't expect everything to come to you quick because it's not. Anything worth ha ha having is going to take time. I'm letting you know that right now. I waited a long time to get a righteous wife. A long life. You know how long I waited? 20, 40 some odd years. Think about that. So anything worth ha having is going to take a long time. And believe me, the sons of Aaron are not exempt. Look how long it took for the God of Israel to speak to the son of Aaron. You think about that. Anything worth having is going to take time. The question is, is can you... Yeah, you know what? Here is the question. Can you compete with time? And you know how you compete with time? Is you become patient. That's the question, right? Can you compete with time? Some of us can't. Some of us got to have it yesterday. The day before. But can you compete with time? Wow. That's heavy, right? Think about that. You meditate on that. I'm going to turn it over to Akohim. We'll wrap it up. You all have a wonderful Shabbat. And uh, we'll, we'll, if, if the Master Yeshua so desires to linger, uh, we'll see you next Shabbat or we'll see you in Israel. How about that? Shabbat Shalom, Mishmah. Have a wonderful Shabbat. And Shalom Shalom to you across the pond as well.
Uh, yeah, to go for that, uh, Rabbi Kiva. Uh, okay, so question, I guess. I guess I have a question and a revelation as well. This is going to be uh, a revelation for those of you who get it. Maybe some of you will not get it. Some of you will get it. But it is a revelation nevertheless. My question to you is this, that today is the Sabbath. You know, barred it from the solar, from the, from the lunar, and from the other, you know, different uh, Sabbaths that people believe. Let's just for, a, for the sake of the argument say that today is a Torah Sabbath, just for the sake of the argument. What did God sanctify? Can anybody tell me please? What did God sanctify? And, and uh, I mean, some of you may have to go back to Genesis to, to uh, re-affirm you know, yourselves or, or maybe you know, memorize. Okay, so God sanctified the Sabbath. What does it actually mean? Now let me ask, maybe, maybe I ask the wrong question. What does it mean sanctified the Sabbath? Well, what is the Sabbath? Let's put it another way. What is the Sabbath? You know, if you ask a Christian, and uh, they'll probably say to you, well, Saturday is the Sabbath, and then, well, what is the Sabbath? What did God set apart? What did He made holy? Okay, so I'm getting a lot of different answers. A, a memorial, a set apart, appointed, set apart, appointment, time. Uh, I have set it apart as a sacred day, a day to, day to rest and focus on Yahweh and blessed it. Okay, all of that, I'm getting all of that. Okay, I, I think somebody gave an answer in there, but I'll come back to that answer in a second. But here is this. Yesterday, no, day before yesterday actually, day before I was sitting down and uh, this revelation came on to me. You know, it doesn't happen very often. <laughs> Sometimes it takes years for that to happen. But this revelation came to me that, that day about the Sabbath. What is the Sabbath? And uh, I was thinking, 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 well, you know, there's people who want to do the sunset, there's people who want to do the sunrise, there's people who want to do the lunar, there's people who want to do the sh shuler, and you know, <laughs> all that, you know, came to me as like, well, you know, people are chasing after lunar, chasing after this, chasing after that. But what did you say? What did you sanctify? You know, that's the question that I ask. What did you sanctify, Lord? What was it that you sanctified? Did you sanctify a lunar Sabbath, solar Sabbath, sunset Sabbath, sunrise Sabbath? What did you actually sanctify? And uh, this is where this is, this revelation is going. But let me let me bring you to a little bit on the science. You know, you can argue about sunset Sabbath, and the Jews do today. You know, the Ashkenazis do the, I, when I say Jews, uh, I don't mean the people of the book, you know, let's just not make, make, mix it up. When I say the Jews, I mean the Ashkenazi, uh, so I just use the label Jews. When I, when, I say, when I say the people of Israel, I say the children of Israel. So we need to get our you know, bearings right in that, because, because, because the Jews today, they don't follow Torah. So I'll come, maybe I'll say something about that in a minute. But Right now, I think the important thing is what did God sanctify and then what did God establish? And I was thinking about it because when you go to Australia, let's say, I don't know how many of you have traveled to Australia. Anybody traveled to Australia from America? Or definitely I know Kifa's traveled to China. Kifa, you traveled to China, right? If you go to China right now, or maybe ask your, ask your wife, if you were to go to China right now, what is the time in China? And what is the time here? Well, we already know what the time is here. It's 12.22 p.m. on my side. Maybe it's, it's 1.22 where you are in Eastern time zone. But what is the time in China? What about Europe? Europe, you know, Europe, you can speak. What are you at this moment? You're now evening. You know, in France right now, it is evening time from what I understand. Okay, so Kifa is saying that in, in, in uh, China right now is 1.22 a.m. So it's the morning time over there. So, and Olivia has got night time over there. So, Olivia, if you've got night time over there, and I've got afternoon here where I am in Pensacola, Florida, and, uh, and Kifa's got night time in China, well, if I'm keeping the Sabbath in the, you know, it's my middle of my afternoon, and for Olivia, it's your night time, and for Kifa in China, it's already the day is already passed over and into oblivion you know, has gone through. You, you're coming into the new day, apparently over there, according to the Chinese. What is the Sabbath? Think about it. If we have four people, if we have three people, three
three people. Let's just take me, Rabbi Kifa, and Olivia. Right now, I'm in the middle of the afternoon. That's supposedly my Sabbath. Okay? For Olivia, that's no longer the case because he's already in the evening. And for Kifa, well, it's the new day. What are you talking about, Simon? What Sabbath? We're in the new day. So what is the Sabbath? So that's a very important question to observe and ask. Yet we have here different groups fighting over time. What is the Sabbath? Sabbath is time. What did God bless? Rabbi Kifa gave the answer back there. He blessed time. He sanctified time. What time did he sanctify? Now let me, let me come to the, to the science side of it. The science says... Listen to this, this is a revelation. There is no such thing, there is no such thing, this is from me, not from science. There is no such thing as a sunset and a sunrise. There is no such thing. What we got, now this is from science, what we got is the earth tilts counterclockwise on its axis and it, it lightens some, some, some parts of the countries and it darkens others. So when it spins, some countries get light, some countries get darkness. There is no such thing as sunrise and sunset. That is an illusion. Sun never sets. Sun never rises. Sun as a, as a solar planet actually stands still all the time. It never goes down behind the sea as we, you know, we, we stand over the beach and I look from Pensacola beach and oh yeah, the sun is setting. The sun never sets. Oh yeah, the sun is rising. The sun never rises. The sun's always there. It's the earth that spins. So what are we fighting about? Think about it. What are we fighting about? Solar, you know. We're fighting about sun, sunrise, sunset, blah, blah, blah. Shizbo said this and holy Shizbo said that. Think about it. Think about it for a second. How people have been deceived. How people have been deceived. You've been deceived by so-called people out there who call themselves Ashkenazi. They are. They are deceiving you. Whether for whether whether by purpose or whether out of purpose or whether ignorantly, whether deliberately. Yeah, they're deceiving everybody. Believe it or not. Because they're telling you that you have to do the sunset seven. What sunset? There is no such thing. There is no such thing as a sunset. And if you said sunrise, well, there's no such thing as a sunrise. But let me let me state the facts. The facts on the ground are this. The earth turns and we get to see light or darkness as it turns. Sun never sets. Because if the sun set, there will be no world. We'll have no plants. We'll have nothing. So, what do we learn from this? You know, this was a, 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 this was a revelation to me when I gave that there's no such thing as sunset, sunrise, but there is such a thing as God's day, God's time. So, what does it actually mean? It means this. Here is what I'm saying, that God sanctified time. And God's, God allowed the sun, God told the sun, or let me say, commanded the sun to remain up all the time. As long as that sun remains up, we have life on this planet. If tomorrow the sun was to really set, there will be no life on this planet. It will be utter darkness. And it will be utterly cold. So cold that we will die from freezing. We will probably all become ice clumps. So let's get that straight. Everything that God has done with the sun is by commandment that the sun has to remain up all the time. 24 times 7. 7 times 365 days a year. And 365 or whatever number of years God has allotted us. So what does that mean? It means that without the sun, we... So what did, what did God bless? Now let's come back to the Sabbath itself. What did God bless? Did He bless the night part of the Sabbath or the day part of the Sabbath? Which part did He bless? So here is the answer. It's revolutionary. God only blessed the, the daylight hours of the Sabbath. So when the earth is tilting and spinning and is doing His little, you know, thing... You know, something came to my mind, it's kind of funny. Sometimes your wife will tilt and do her things as well. So, you know, and you get darkness in the house. Be careful about that. So when the earth is, is spinning and tilting, and you get this spin, and you either have light or darkness, right? Think about it just for a second. If you have light or darkness, if you're going to get light, that is the part that God is blessed. God has blessed the light part of time 
every seventh day, whatever you call your seventh day, you know, your seventh day could be Mumba Jumba Lumba, who cares what is your seventh day? Whatever the seventh day that God has allotted, that time, I mean, even if you're wrong all the time, even if you're wrong all the time, you might be right one times, you know, possibly a month. You might be right one times a month, maybe every two months you get it right, you know, if you were totally wrong of the day. Irrespective of that, you will fall within that time, that time zone, within one, at least one times in a month, hopefully. And if you are if you are doing the solar system, the solar Sabbath, you will fall right every week. Because guess why? Because the sun never sets and the sun never rose. It's when the earth lights up in your district, when the earth spins and gives you light, that is your Sabbath time, when Sabbath is sanctified, or the time is sanctified. God has made that time so holy that everything you do within that time, when you sit, when you sit before the Creator of the universes, before that time, He gets to hear you. You know, He is allotted that time to hear our complaints. In other words, your moanings and your groanings, He hears on that time. Because He is allotted that time to set separately, where He sits down as the King of the universes. He sits, He listens to His people. What, is my, what are my people up to? Are they still whining like they were whining in Egypt? Or are they doing something productive? So everything that you speak, everything that you say, is heard by Him, and He acts on it. So if you continue to say, I'm cursed, I'm cursed, I'm cursed, well, He'll act on it and make sure you're cursed. And if you continue to remind God that He commanded a blessing upon you, He'll make sure that you get a blessing upon yourself. So what I, what I realized from this, I thought, how fascinating is this? You know, people don't even think like that. It's a revolutionary thinking. Think about it. There is no such thing as a sunset. So why are people being fooled into believing a Sabbath as sunset? Because there's no such thing. If the sun is always up, what is it? People, sunrise. Always. It's always sunrise. It's only the earth doing its little dance that causes the sun not to be visible or to be visible whilst it's doing its dance. Think about that for a second. So if that is the case, I think this is, a, this is an amazing thing that God did. He sanctified sunrise, the light of day, He sanctified it. Because when it's night, what do you care? Well, I care if it's night, we all you know, want to sleep or do something, you know, we're kind of like all getting ready for bed, or whatever. Sun is always up. Think about it. The sun, S-U-N, and the S-O-N also is always up. Master Yeshua, whose Yahweh is always up, and His Son that He placed, the planet that He commanded to give light to the earth, is always up as well. So what is it? What is the day then? The day is always going to be sunrise. It's never going to be sunset. There's no such thing. There is no such thing as sunset. But there is such a thing as light. There is such a thing. So I think we need to, we need to meditate on that. Because that will help you to understand the Sabbath sanctification. The sanctification of the Sabbath. And the time that you're in. It is that 12 hour slot. Roughly, give and take, you know, a few minutes here, a few minutes there. Over or, or, or minus or plus. So the Master Yeshua said, is it not 12 hours in the day? So he told you there. The sun always remains up, absolutely. The sun always remains up. That means we always have sunrise. So the sun is always going to be a witness. What is the sun set as a witness to? The sun is set as a witness to sanctification of time by God. We can, you know, all of us can argue. We can argue about a sunset Sabbath, a lunar Sabbath, a, a solar Sabbath, or some other Sabbath. But you know what it's going to come down to? the sun as a witness. If the sun is always up, well, what is it? What do you call that? Call that a solar day. So according to the solar day, the Sabbath can never be anything other than sunrise. Uh, that's an important consideration to consider. You know, uh, there's a lot of deception out there on YouTube and other places, other social networks, a lot of deception. Yesterday, you know, I, I, I was hearing this lecture 
I mean, I kind of was in the room, you know, in and out of the room, printing some stuff. And the there was this lecture going on in the in the in the room that uh, the Aisha here had put up, and it was a Judaism's lecture, and it was the most rubbish thing that I've ever heard. But I always I'm not going to make comment on that, but I will make a comment on the lecture, its content. What I heard at that point was so so stupid, you know, that I can what can I say to you? It was a, regarding Kabbalah and regarding uh, regarding the, the the holy name of God. The rabbi that was presiding, he was some Kabbalistic rabbi, and he was saying to the effect of that Rabbi Hanania, you know, saying Rabbi Hanania in the ancient past knew about the Shem Varash, you know, he, he knew about the holy name, he knew how to pronounce it, and he is speaking about uh, some other rabbis, the martyrs. He was speaking about the martyrs, you know, I think he was from Texas, he was speaking this funny Texas twang. He was calling martyrs, mortars. You know, they were mortars. I was like, what the hell is he talking about, mortars? What mortars? That's a that's a thing that we fire in the in the, in the army. So, and I kind of like listen to it a little bit. He's talking about the martyrs, in the martyrs in Judaism. He's saying, oh, the the mortars, the mortars, the ten mortars, and he's like, and he's talking like that. And I was like, you know, I wanted to I wanted to listen to a little bit what he said. And he said. He said, it doesn't matter whether you call him Yahweh, you call him Yudhe, Vavahe, or you call him something else. He goes, people don't know that, you know, you're not supposed to uh, uh, usher, usher the name. And uh, uh, some rabbi, you know, he quotes some rabbi from the Talmud, and he says that Rabbi, Khan, uh, rabbi Hanania, he knew how to pronounce the name. He pronounced the name, and some rabbi, because of this pronunciation, because he, he wouldn't refuse to... Uh, not pronounce it, you know, he was uh, uh, severely judged because he didn't listen to the decree by the rabbis, blah blah blah, all this baloney, honestly, total BS. What a total, total BS. And I was thinking, I was sitting there and I just had to, you know, shut myself, zip myself up. I, because, you know, the Aisha was sitting there, they wanted to say, what a lot of rubbish he's speaking about. You know, he was making it sound like that if you say the name of Yahweh, that God is going to going to be, you know, cast you out, burn you down and judge you for it. Almost to that effect. And I was like, what a load of rubbish. What nonsense you're speaking about, man. You don't even know what you're talking about. You're such an idiot and a liar. Because, you know, your Kabbalah is just that. Total BS. And, and so he was, you know, saying those words and my goodness, he was saying that somehow that the, the rabbi that was burnt, you know, there was a rabbi that was burnt on the stake and under, with the Torah scroll and he said he saw the letters of the Torah scroll up because apparently that rabbi according to his theology was was saying the name out loud and he shouldn't have been saying the name because of rabbinic authorities decrees and so therefore the you know the Torah scroll was burnt with him wrapped in it you see this is the kind of uh, weird thinking this is a weird thinking that these people have it's a very weird thinking and it's a very contorted, uh, very stupid way to think. Very, very stupid way to think. Because you cannot think like that, that, that God is going to judge you for taking His name. Because God tells you that my name will be great amongst the nations. Are you telling me that you take the name of God and, you know, how are you going to take the name of God for a start? How, we, how you as a Gentile, as a person who never touched the Bible and suddenly come into the revelation that Yahweh is God, for argument's sake, how is that going to be a detriment to your life? Because God says in His Word that, that the nations will take His name and will be blessed. Was this rabbi on YouTube was telling everybody that you'll take His name and you'll be cursed. Just like the other rabbi was burnt, you will also be burnt. You know, maybe not literally, maybe in another way. But I, I thought for a second and I thought, what kind of distorted and rubbish teaching is that? And if you listen to that kind of garbage, if you listen to that kind of garbage, then you know what's going to happen. You're going to become garbage. This is the problem. When you are not in sync with the God of Israel, with the God of the Bible, with the God of children of Israel, with the God of Abraham, when you're not in sync with that God, you come up with all sorts of contorted theologies. And there's so much of that on YouTube. I guess one search and you'll find so many lectures on the Kabbalistic idea of God. 
and you know why you know why a name could be said in a certain way then we spoke about the golem earlier that the golem you know they'll make the golem speak through the name because they, you know what they'll do they'll, they'll write the name and they'll pop it in his mouth in the Hebrew and they'll make him speak and that's some kind of a miraculous feat by the way but it's not because all it is is trying to use a name for magic that's all it is nothing more and the Israelites are too familiar with that the ancient Israelites are too familiar with that because they also tried to do magic with the golden calf when they were dancing and singing around the golden calf they made the golden calf move they made it speak and that was very displeasing to God very displeasing so so much so that that you know he had to deal with them at that point in time and history so I think we've got to be very careful that that what you hear on YouTube I would weigh it with a with a grain of you know with a grain of or a pinch of salt. I would test it, and I would make sure that this is what our our Torah, our Holy Bible, 66 books, all of them, that they are saying that. Because if they are not saying that, then whatever you are hearing is a mumbo jumbo, lumbo combo. You know, it's just rubbish, and you just need to just leave it leave it alone. Because all you're going to do is going to dissatisfy yourself, dissatisfy your life following such theologies but hey you know I don't spend my time listening to theologies like that but I'm just giving you and this is, this is by the by I heard this and I was like shocked really shocked that this is the kind of theology out there on the internet that if you take the name of God that you know such things can happen to you or even to, even to purport to such a thing my goodness the, you know, the, the, the Bible says that God's name is a refuge in times of trouble are you telling me that in times of trouble God's name is not a refuge? My goodness. Golem is spelled as G O L A M. So it's very important to understand that that in times of trouble the name of Yahweh or if you pronounce it Yehovah, the name of Yehovah, the name of Yahweh in times of trouble is a refuge for us. I hate to think when people teach counter counter philosophies based on their stupid 16th century uh, you know idealistic uh, witchcraft type Kabbalah that is not in the scriptures the holy scriptures so you can contort and you can distort the Hebrew and you can make something that it's not saying it's very easy to do that it is very easy to take something in the Bible and twist it turn it and make it something it isn't and to and to be and to say something that it never said very easy to be deceived by a lot of the rabbis out there who will teach you these things who will you who will even make a talit holy you know you you go to buy a talit talit garment it's a garment it's nothing special about a talit it's just a piece of cloth you go to buy this piece of cloth, it might set you back about $150 for a large size one. $150. What is special about $150 or $170? You might, might, might be unfortunate to pay more if you were in London. If you went to London to buy a, a large size tarot, it will cost you more money. In gold, you know, in place like Stamford Hill and Golders Green, and probably the same in New York. So you go to Ashkenazi store, it's going to cost you a lot more money. Now, why would you pay $170 for a garment that is not even commanded in the Bible? Is a, can anybody tell me if a talit has been commanded in the Bible anywhere? Anywhere in the Bible talit is commanded? I don't read it. I don't read anywhere that says you've got to buy a talit. But there are some zidzers attached to it and zidzers are commanded for males not for females so I mean if you attach zidzers to a t-shirt or if you attach to a talit what is holy the t-shirt or the talit what is holy Mishpacha is the t-shirt holy if you attach the zidzers or is the talit holy thank you for that Yael woman of the tent neither is holy that's absolutely true neither is holy 
what is what is holy? Holy is going to be the person set apart, right, upright. Is going to be the person who wears it. If he does the right thing, if he doesn't, it doesn't matter whether whether he wears it or not. So this is what the master Yeshua said when he was challenging the Pharisees. If you remember the discussions he had with the Pharisees, he said, "What is holy? The building or the man standing here?" And they had an they had an issue with that. Because to them the building was holy, not the man standing there. To that, you know, to 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 summarize, kind of giving you paraphrasing of what he said, not the exact not the exact verse when he was when he was having a discussion with the the religious elite. He asked that question as well: What is holy? You know, he spoke about the altar. What is holy? The gift or the altar? So we got to we got to think about these things. It is important that we think that what do we classify as holy in our lives? There is a lot of deception out there. There's a lot of deception out there. I would encourage everybody to hear anything out there or or hear because you know a lot of you like to venture out. I I I see that. I see that a lot of you like to venture out. Me, you listen to this and you listen to that, and a little bit of this and a little bit of that, and you think that that will strengthen your theology. And maybe you know, maybe maybe it might. I don't know. But you know, the, uh, what happens is sometimes it doesn't strengthen your theology; it weakens it. Because you're hearing a little bit of this rubbish and a little bit of that rubbish, and the two rubbish don't make up a good good theology. So you got to be careful of what you listen to. What you input is very important because that's what you will output. So it's very important to realize that is that we are like speakers. You know, we're like uh, amplifiers. Yeah, yes, I was talking about a golem. So, so we we we're like talking about amplify. We like we like we like amplifiers. And amplifiers, you know, we amplify, so we can amplify something. So if you hear a theology on the internet, you can amplify it. You know, you can go tell it to somebody else, and tell it to somebody else from this. He tells it to somebody else. So you amplify it, like a network. <coughs> so the only thing that we need to amplify, Mishpacha, is the right things that help us. That's the only thing we need to amplify. And so. We have to remember the words given to Moses and the words given through the Master that we spoke about earlier today. And if we remember what is important, you know, you want everything given to you. That's nice. Nothing wrong with that. You having nice things. But what did he say? Pursue righteousness first, and everything will be added to you. So there is something else he said, and maybe we'll, you know, maybe we'll look at that another time. And that something else was, who is going to enter the kingdom of heaven? We'll probably look at that next week. So if if I, you know, I'll have to write that down as a point for next week. Who is going to enter the kingdom of heaven? So with that, I will uh, say to Dar for attending the the Sabbath lecture and uh, to hear the words of the Master Yeshua and the Torah the law of Moses and uh, that we may do the right thing in our lives and may you all be blessed in the name of Abraham, Isaac and Jacob in the name of Yahweh blessings be upon you call Israel wherever you are in the nations and until next week Judah Shabbat Shalom and Shalom Shalom to you